Thank you very much. Then everyone, welcome to the March 4th Select Board meeting. Um, we have, I just want to make one note about an agenda change from last week as far as what people's expectations might have been. Um, we talked last week about the fact that we were planning to have the uh, 2013 paving plan this time, but we're not going to do that. That's going to be, uh, that's been postponed until March 18th. Uh, Mr. Musanti will give us a kind of a brief preview of that during the town manager's report, but we're going to have the full presentation of that uh, and discussion, comment, et cetera, um, on the 18th. So just so folks are aware. Um, so with that, I would like to get started with public comment. Um, can I have a sense of how many folks are here for public comment on things not on the agenda? Perfect, very good too, not so bad. So please come forward, identify yourself at the mic. And uh, Hi, I'm Jack Hirsch, I live at 400, 400 Flathills Road. And I'm here to express concern about the uh, potential development of the land that's in Chapter 61, um, owned by Cinda Jones. Um, we live in a quiet rural neighborhood. Um, this is the kind of housing that's going to um, be the most dense for automobiles that you can imagine. I mean, if it were families, they might have one or two cars per cottage, but with four students per cottage, they'll undoubtedly have four cars. Um, it's a quiet area. This is beautiful conservation land. We'd love to see um, it used more in the um, sense that the master plan tried to encourage um, for conservation land. Um, so needless to say, I'm um, organizing with many neighbors um, opposition and you'll hear from us more in the future but okay. we're very concerned thank you very much for coming in sir thank you I'd um, like to thank the board for this opportunity to, to speak with you um, my name is Jeremy Coleman I'm also uh, own a home on Flat Hills Road actually Jack's neighbor and uh, also here to express concern over the proposed uh, housing development for that part of, of town. Uh, I've lived there for about a year and a half. We, we moved there uh, because of the natural beauty of the area and the woods. Um, I'm a wildlife biologist. I specialize in wildlife conservation and I have great concerns in addition to one that, that Jack mentioned uh, for habitat degradation and impacts to wildlife in that area. Uh, we have lots of trails in that area. The Robert Frost Trail is there. Uh, the Monadnock Trail is there, the Walt Whitman Trail, and uh, one of the things that drew, drew us to that location is the natural beauty. We have barred owls in our backyard. We've got red-shouldered hawks that uh, nest uh, right next to us, probably in woodpeckers. Um, and uh, you're also very familiar with the, what we call herpetofauna, the salamanders that are found in that area. And uh, I, I see this proposed development as having major impacts to the wildlife that, that's there. Clear cutting that area, putting in the parking areas, the, the housing development could cause uh, erosion and lots of downstream impacts. It's a pretty steep sloped area. If you're familiar with it, we could have uh, major impacts to the spotted salamander crossing zone that is very famous uh, for that part of town. And we could also have other impacts from the pollution, uh, automobiles, and in this time of green building and concerns over carbon uh, footprints, uh, locating a high density student housing development far removed from campus that requires driving and busing of students back and forth to campus, uh, I feel is, is uh, going in the wrong direction. We, I would think that the university, UMass, and the town of Amherst would be looking for solutions to a housing problem that would be uh, more green friendly than uh, requiring lots of driving. So. Uh, there are other impacts that, that Jack mentioned some to the, the local area for traffic and uh, kind of just general impacts to our, our quality of life there that I think are also uh, part of our concern. And as he mentioned, we have been uh, talking with lots of neighbors around, um, many of whom that I've spoken with also share these concerns. Thank you very much. You. Anyone else for public comment for any issue that's not on the agenda? Okay, um, so uh, as folks know, we don't deliberate anything that happens during public comment, but I will take this opportunity to just uh, let the public know what to expect as far as the, uh, the process involved with the development of the land uh, that was just being 
uh, commented on. Um, so this land is in Chapter 61. Uh, that means that it, in order for it to be developed, it has to come out of Chapter 61. Chapter 61 means that the town has the right of first refusal on that. So th whether or not to exercise that right will first be considered for recommendation to the Select Board by the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board. They will consider those issues, make their recommendations to us, and then the Select Board would ultimately uh, d make a decision to exercise or not exercise that right um, the the only option there is whether the town would buy the land that it's not that the option is you keep it in chapter either we take it out of chapter because that's the request and uh, either it gets to be purchased by a, a purchaser um, or it could be purchased by the town so the town would need to come up with money to to do that after that assuming that all happens as planned. Um, the the process will then be determined by the details of the plan. The details of the plan are not have not been submitted to the town yet. This will either be a process that goes through special permit through the ZBA or through site plan review through the planning board. Um, Conservation Commission will also have a role because of the uh, environmental impacts that you talked about. Um, this will not come to the select board again. At some point, the select board may desire to take a position to support or not support this as it goes forward, but the place to uh, express your concerns, your environmental concerns and your other impact concerns will be at the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board, whichever, uh, whichever permitting route it takes, uh, and environmental concerns would go to Conservation Commission. I would, uh, we don't know what the timing is on any of this stuff yet. Um, something that I've advised some of your neighbors about uh, is to sign up on the town website for notifications. You can get email notifications of all meetings that are posted, so that way you can be be sure to um, be informed about the meetings that will be addressing this topic so that uh, because abutters receive direct notices but not everyone who's concerned about this is a direct abutter so uh, so I would recommend you do that and uh, and by all means be engaged in the process at all of those levels because uh, your input will um, will help to shape whatever comes forward so that is all thank you okay anybody else for public comment on anything okay we have a couple minutes then before we get to our first Timed items, so let's take care of a couple of untimed items. Um, first, I'll say the approved language for nuisance house bylaw amendment article. I don't have language for you to approve yet. <laughs> The status of this, as I told the select board several weeks ago, is uh, I've been working with a resident to try and make some uh, changes to the to the nuisance house <coughs> bylaw. Um, I haven't heard from that person in a couple of weeks. I'm not sure if she's decided to pursue it as a petition article. Um, it's a little bit of a pain to deal with because we just dealt with this at fall town meeting. So the language has gone to the attorney general's office, but it hasn't come back in its approved form yet. So dealing with the different kinds of cross outs and whatever was just a little bit more than I could do to, uh, to get this ready. Um, as I told you when we talked about it last time, this would be focused on a couple of minor changes that um, that the select board had already indicated a, a probable support for when we had the discussions about nuisance house bylaw last time, which were um, when uh, when this was brought forward in the fall for town meeting, we had concerns about the fact that the bylaw has all along a, um, included information about response costs being assessed at the first, second, uh, potentially being assessed for the first, second, and third occurrence um, to the property owners or property managers. Everybody kind of thought that it was only on the third um, occurrence, not the first two, so that would take care of that. It would actually, um, the, the changes being proposed would have it not, have response costs not be assessed at the first or second um, occurrence, but would actually accrue to the third. So if you if you ended up at the third place, then then you would get them, uh, the, the property owner or manager would get them for all three responses. It would take out fire and ambulance from those <coughs> response costs because that's not really that relevant and people are thinking that that's not, um, that, that's not an intention here as to, uh, it, it's really about capturing the police response costs. Um, it would also strike out that sentence that talks about um, the calendar year. The, there's currently a sentence in there that says um, that if, that it only applies to three violations that happen within a calendar year per, um, per the same residence. 
So anytime the residents change the the um, the or it said not calendar year, it says 12 month period. Um, so it would strike that part so that it would be, which really makes it more of a nuisance house violation on the tenant rather than the property. And the goal is to make it about the property. Um, we do have one point of um, non-agreement uh, between the resident and I right now um, about one other thing to strike. And I'm not sure if because of that, she'll wanna pursue it herself. And that is the part that currently says, um, no violations would be or penalties would be enforced against a landlord or property manager who is in the process of evicting the tenant. The resident who I'm working with considers this to be a loophole. I don't consider that to be a loophole. Uh, the more I've gone through the safe and healthy neighborhoods process, the more I recognize what a very strong and difficult action eviction is. And I just don't see why you would enforce a penalty against somebody who is who is really doing the ultimate. Uh, as far as trying to solve the problem. Um, so I will I will e either put this forth if the select board is still good with it uh, as a select board article in time for the um, warrant deadline um, or the petitioner will do that and I just don't know the answer to that yet. But if, if nobody is uh, dissatisfied with the <coughs> lack of certainty about that, then that's kind of how I'd proceed. Mr. Musanti? Yeah, I would just add on a related uh, note uh, uh, Police Chief Livingstone has reviewed with me a, an outline of uh, a detailed schedule of police response costs that would be a logical uh, accompaniment, which is already called for in the existing bylaw. And you can expect, I've asked him to translate that into a you know, detailed memorandum. And I will forward that to you uh, when I receive it as early as later this week. Terrific, thank you. So, uh, Ms. Burr. So, just to uh, clarify in terms of dates, since next Monday at noon is the deadline for citizen petitions, will you just go ahead then, given the long description we've had in the previous conversations we've had about this at Select Board, will you just go ahead with your piece and assume that it'll go in at noon, like other, everything else, and then if she happens to also do a citizen petition, then we sort it out later? I'm hoping to get it worked out before then because okay. it's actually a lot of work on my yeah, part. So exactly. I'm, <laughs> I, I need to, I'm trying to sort I would really out, like, like to, okay. to uh, coordinate with her. Um, yeah. So, so I, I don't want us both to be doing this. But if something will end up on the warrant either way. Presumably. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, let's see. Where are we? Two more minutes. So let's do a couple of motions. How about how about the special liquor licenses? Because that's easy. Sure. Oh, I no. move that the select board approve its special all alcohol license for a student casino event in the Keith Campus Center, Amherst College, on Friday, March 8th, 2013, <coughs> from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Molly Ben, catering manager. Second. Further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve a special wine and malt license for a reception in the Eisenberg <coughs> School of Management Atrium, UMass Amherst, on Saturday, April 27, 2013, from 3.30 p.m. to 5 p.m., Judy Bardwell, clerk, talk with top of the campus. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, say aye. Incorporated. Aye. Excuse me. Aye. That is unanimous. Okay, it says on our agenda one about um, Friends of the Jones Library. We don't have that motion in front of us. That was actually supposed to be postponed until next time. We're still trying to figure out what's going on with that. So um, we have a gift of acceptance if you want to do that. Uh, let's see, gift acceptance. Top sure. Yep. I move that the select board accept a gift of tangible personal property from Ann Broner of Hadley, Massachusetts, as provided for in MGL Chapter 44, <coughs> Section 53A and a half, described as an original Stephen Hamilton watercolor for addition to the collection housed in the Amherst Police Department. Second. Further discussion. I will just note that um, this is a lovely gift from a local resident, a woman who lives in Hadley. Uh, she had read about the police department having a collection of Stephen Hamilton uh, paintings, so she wanted to donate this. Um, and this is a, a it is 
because when you give a gift to the town, somebody has to make a formal acceptance of it, so that is the select board's role here. Um, we did extend an invitation to Ms. Bronner to, to come in and be recognized for her donation. If she wanted to do that, she opted not to do that. So uh, we thank her very much for her generosity and uh, are happy to accept this gift on behalf of the town. Further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay, good timing. 6.45. So now we have the most fascinating 15 minutes of local television. <laughs> this is when we, uh, we sign our names about 100 times on bond, uh, bond notices. But first we will have an introduction to the bond topic from collector Claire McGinnis and finance director Sandy Pooler. And as usual, folks who are following along at home will find all of the details uh, about this in the select board's <coughs> packet. We have a great memo that summarizes everything, and, uh, and then we're going to be signing for a long time. So Ms. McGinnis and Mr. Pooler, take it away. Um, so this is a bond issue to fund projects voted at um, the last two town meetings. Um, the tree planting project is included here. Half of the amount is borrowed um, this time. Uh, a dump truck for the Public Works Department, repairs to Central Fire Station, communications equipment for the Police Department, a million dollars for road improvements, and the largest by far portion of this is um, over four million dollars for sewer extensions to the neighborhoods called Harkness Road and Amherst Woods. So um, Standard & Poor's confirmed our credit rating at AA stable, which is um, great news. And um, the resulting total interest cost for this combined issue is under 2%. Uh, money is very affordable right now. We got 1.819% total interest cost on this issue. So it's a lot of documents, and I'll go f through an introduction to all of that um, after questions. Okay, does anybody have any questions about this? As noted, all of this borrowing has been previously approved by town meeting, so we are just uh, fulfilling their wishes and taking care of this. Um, one question that I had was about the, uh, the first part of the motion um, looks unfamiliar. Do we usually do this? The thing about issuing refunding bonds? The town occasionally refunds bonds. Um, some, depending on what you say when you first sell the bond, you have the chance to have a little do-over and refund. In other words, you, um, if you borrow at a certain interest rate before you've finished paying off the bonds, you basically get to um, pay them off early and, and re-borrow that same money at a lower interest rate. Um, those opportunities come up every now and then. It all depends on where you are in the life of the bond and whether at the time you originally sold the bond, you reserve the right to refund that bond. Sometimes the town does that, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so I think the last time there was refunding was four or five years ago. Um, this bond just happened to come up at a, be eligible for refunding with interest rates so low. <coughs> Um, our financial advisor, uh, uh, David Eisenthal from Unibank, said the town could save approximately $66,000 in interest costs um, by doing a refunding. So that's why you see it here. It, it is not something that you typically see in a bond. Okay, thank you. Other questions, Ms. Stein? I'm just curious what it means when you say as part of the sale, the winning bid provided a premium of $263,195. What that does that mean? <laughs> yes, what does that mean? <laughs> exactly my question. Um, it means that uh, we have sold bonds and those bonds carry a uh, certain face value interest rate. Most of them are between two and three percent. Um, however, the bond, the people who bought the bonds, um, they're competitive with each other. And so they are essentially um, giving us back some of the interest that we would have to pay them up front. That's called a premium. So it's a way for them 
to have us overall pay a lower effective interest rate when Claire said the interest rate on this is 1.8 percent. Right. It's because when you factor in the face value of the interest rate you pay minus this premium, you get an effective interest rate of 1.8 percent. And that's just part of the bidding process. When people bid on bonds, they sometimes throw in a premium and sometimes don't. That's really helpful because I couldn't understand why the interest rates looked so different and then they were 1.8 something. So perfect. Thank you. Other questions? All right. What else do you want to tell us before we start signing? Anything? Um, I guess the thing we didn't say about the refunding is it's projected us to save us over the remaining life of the Crocker Farm bond issue, which was done in 2003. It's projected to save us about $60,000. All right. So then before we start signing, tell us what we have to make sure. If we Is it just black ink or black or blue or something like that? Black or blue is fine. Um, there are, I'm going to try to give them to you in bundles that make sense. If they get out of order, don't worry about it. I'll collate and count at the end because it's kind of a lot. Um, it's my understanding that Mr. Hayden continues to be the clerk, so I have a couple of special documents for him alone. Um, so I'll s if, if this works, I'll start well. Um, can you read the motion? Because I have to sign <coughs> in front of you, and then I'll have documents ready to circulate. All right, so Ms. Stein will now read the motion for the next five minutes. <laughs> which, which I will, and, and the audience at home and everyone here should understand it's a page and a half single space, so bear <laughs> exactly. with us. I move that the select board approve the bond issuance, um, and it's stated as this, approve that in order to reduce interest costs, the treasurer is authorized to issue refunding bonds at one time or from time to time pursuant to Chapter 44, Section 21A of the General Laws or pursuant to any other enabling authority to refund all of the town's $4 million um, dollars general obligation municipal purpose bond loan of 2003 bonds dated October 1, 2003, mature, maturing on and after October 1, 2014, inclusive, parens collectively the, quote, refunded bonds, uh, end quote, in parenthesis, and that the proceeds of any refunding bonds issued pursuant to this vote shall be used to pay the principal redemption premium and interest on the refunded bonds and costs of issuance of the refunding bonds and further approve that the sale of the $6,847,000 general obligation municipal purpose loan of 2013 bonds of the town dated March 14, 2013, parens, the quote in bonds, end quote, parens, in parens, to Robert W. Baird and Company, Incorporated, at the price of $7,164,514.84 and accrued interest, if any, is hereby approved and confirmed. The bond shall be payable on October 1st of the years and in the principal amounts and bear interest at the respective rates as follows. 2013, $447,000. Two percent. 2014, $660,000. 2015, $6,000,000. 2016, $6,000,000. 2017, $635,000. Two thousand eighteen, five hundred and fifteen thousand dollars, three percent. Two thousand nineteen, three hundred and twenty five thousand dollars, three percent. Two hundred and twenty three, three hundred and twenty five thousand dollars, three percent. Two thousand twenty one, three hundred and twenty five thousand dollars, three percent. 
2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 
issued six point eight million point eight eight million dollars in debt for projects approved by town meeting. Uh, we've secured uh, a, a winning bid of net interest costs of about 1.8 percent, which, you know, Sandy, Claire, and I have been talking. This is by a substantial margin the lowest interest rate in my 20-something year career related to a municipal bond sale on, a, on a, effectively a 10-year bond to have the net cost be below 2 percent is uh, terrific. Uh, and then the second point being uh, that just allows our capital budget to go that much further because we're paying less in interest and more on the actual projects uh, as a percentage of the total. Uh, but Standard & Poor is affirming our, on an independent basis, affirming our uh, AA bond rating with a stable uh, rating. Uh, while the economy is beginning to recover, uh, it's still you know, you can still call it as a fra as, describe it as a fragile recovery, but the uh, uh, S and P, citing again our strong in Amherst, our strong and stable economic base, anchored by the flagship campus of UMass as well as Amherst and Hampshire colleges, good income and wealth indicators, which are particularly significant given the high student uh, population. Uh, they cited us for good financial management, good reserve levels, and I would add growing, uh, and low overall debt burden and a rapid uh, debt amortization. We, we pay off over 80% of our debt service within the next 10 years. So all of those things collectively uh, paint a very good, uh, very good picture of the town, especially given what we've been through the last you know, several years, and it's reassuring to me as town manager to receive an independent uh, review like that of, of the town's financial condition. Thank you. Mr. Walton. Oh, could I just ask, is there anything to be said about the fact that OPEB and uh, indebtedness <coughs> is mentioned for the first time, not affecting our bond rating, but simply mentioned there? Yeah, I, I would ask Sandy to, uh, Talk about that for a moment. So after citing all of the strengths that the town has in its finances and management, the S&P bond rating report specifically mentioned a however, and that is that we have a very large um, OPEB uh, liability. And um, in talking with the analysts about it, they made clear that if you look at our OPEB liability, it is, uh, I think, 125% of our annual operating budget, um, which on a national level is very high. Um, probably within Massachusetts, it's not that unusual, but they're looking at bonds all over the country. Um, and as you probably know, typically we tend to have higher benefits here in the Northeast. We also tend to have higher income, so we can support it. But um, I think it is an indication that Standard & Poor's is taking OPEB liability much more seriously in its analysis of bond ratings than it ever has before. You would not have seen that same sort of comment a year ago. And um, I think it's just in, in indicative of a trend. Uh, and for us, I think what it means is that we need to continue our efforts to fund OPEB to work toward a sustainable way of putting money aside for OPEB on a year in and year out basis that <coughs> is, will make more of a difference as, as much as they've appreciated and noted our one-time contributions. I think they'll be looking for us to do something on an ongoing basis. So I think that's the import of having that comment there and, and just a reminder to us that we need to continue to work on um, funding those long-term health insurance obligations <coughs> for retirees. Ms. Brewer. Do you have any sense from them if it's the regularity of it or the amount of it that's of primary importance? I mean, obviously, lots of money all the time would be a good thing, but in terms of realistically how, how we might approach it from their standpoint? Well, that's a good question, and we're trying to get a sense of that. Um, I do think uh, having a regular funding plan is very important to them. If it was a regular funding pan of a penny a year, that probably wouldn't be so good. Too much. 
So there has to, you know, you, you have to make some material progress toward your goal. Um, so I, th I think that's important. They also, in our conversations with them, also mentioned our uh, unfunded pension liability. And if you look at where Hampshire County Retirement Board is now, they're, uh, I think, 56% funded, which um, is a dip from where they were a few years ago because they're still absorbing some of the losses of 2008. Um, so we have a couple of big pots <coughs> of empty money there or, or, or liabilities. Hampshire County, we will be funding on a regular basis, and I think as that goes up over time, um, that will help us. Within our own budget, we have put money aside in the water fund and the sewer fund uh, in our proposed budget for FY14 to fund the annual minimal required contribution, which is about 15% of our overall liabilities. So um, by taking that step with the enterprise funds, I think we're taking an important step for, toward regular funding of at least a slice of that liability. And then the challenge will be to continue to do that with the general fund for the town and the school budgets. Anything else we can talk about while we find <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just mention on, on OPEB, we do have a final um, valuation for our latest valuation as of July 1st, 2012. And so um, I was just talking to Andy Steinberg, the chair of the Finance Committee the other night about tr getting something scheduled for a joint meeting with finance and the select board to present that um, actuarial to you. Um, so we'll be working to, to get that before you. Secret until then? <laughs> Uh, no, it's not a secret. Uh, I, I just, I just, I think in the past it's just for efficiency's sake, um, and bringing in the actuary in that's more efficient to do it once. Um, the long and the short of it is our um, liabilities <coughs> continue to go up, um, both because um, we hadn't set any money aside, so uh, things t tend to grow, and this actuary did things a little bit differently than the previous actuary, and and. You know, actuaries are always looking at things like mortality tables, and um, I find it fascinating, actually, that there's just not one set of rules that every actuary in the state has to follow to, to do these things, but uh, be that as it may, uh, some of those things did uh, affect the numbers, and so I th we're up over $100 million uh, now, and I think it's 104. Um, interestingly, if this legislation that the governor has introduced passes that limits the health insurance benefits that retirees get and links it more to your years of service, um, if, that hap if that passes any time in the next two years, then our next actuarial will look very different too. Um, you'll start to see a kind of break on those long-term liabilities. Because after all, there are two ways to, to bring down your overall obligations. You put a lot of money aside, <coughs> to match against your liabilities, <coughs> or you bring down your liabilities by limiting your exposure. Um, so I think it's going to be an interesting couple of years to see what happens at the state level with that. And those these numbers are going to be, I think, in flux for the next couple of years. Interesting. Thank you. Is there anything else we need to know or do related to the bonds? All right. Thank you. I can only imagine what it takes to prepare that paperwork to get it in order for us to, uh, to sign a million times, uh, each of us. So thank you very much. Thank you for all the work that went into um, to putting the town on the bond market and, uh, and getting the excellent results through Standard and Poor's, et cetera, and really everything that went into what you had to do for tonight. So thank you very much. Okay, so we are now behind. Uh, but our 7 o'clock item is on my agenda, which is gone. Here it is, okay. Seven o'clock item is the public hearing. This has been duly noticed. Uh, this is about a variety of changes to downtown parking regulations. Um, we have a, a memo in our web packets, uh, in our uh, select board packets rather, that is available on the web that details these changes. And I am going to uh, hand it over to Mr. Misanti to, uh, to talk us through these items. Thank you, and I'd like to uh, 
briefly walk through a series of recommendations uh, and you know, look forward to your comments and questions. Um, so I, as Ms. Uh, O'Keefe uh, has said, uh, these are summarized in a, in a uh, memorandum to the select board from myself that is uh, in your meeting packet and is on the posted online packet. Um, the recommendations, which we do periodically uh, for parking regulations, uh, the revisions, uh, these have been developed with a lot of input from many people, uh, including staff, and I want to particularly recognize uh, Claire McGinnis, treasurer collector, who also is in heavily involved in our administration of the parking system, uh, the DPW and, and Guilford Mooring and staff, uh, police department, Chris Pronovost, our parking enforcement officers, uh, Sandy Pooler and others. Also received a lot of uh, good feedback, uh, reviewing draft recommendations with the Amherst Business Improvement District, Alex Crow Grabe uh, and members of the bid. Uh, we've talked with others affected uh, by these uh, uh, proposed uh, changes, including uh, management at the Lord Jeffrey Inn. I've, I've talked with multiple uh, neighbors who are affected, including many on Gaylord Street, which is one of our, our recommendations. And I want to just punch through these. Um, Before you do that, let me just interrupt sure. you. Um, and just to note that uh, I opened this public hearing at 710 when I first started talking about it. Thank you. That is all. Go ahead. <laughs> Let's be very formal about these things. Go my minutes thing there for a moment. Uh, so just getting to the recommendations themselves. The first set of recommendations relates to com commercial loading zones. Uh, and there's an accompanying map uh, to the memo. Uh, the first recommendation is to add one commercial loading zone uh, on Main Street uh, uh, next to the town hall lot uh, uh, on Main Street, uh, um, west of the PVTA bus stop. So as you turn a turn left onto Main Street from from North Pleasant, uh, there'd be a commercial loading zone. We think there's plenty of room there. It can it can really serve as a loading zone without taking up any other regular parking spaces. Uh, also recommending that three commercial loading zone spaces on the north side of Main Street by Town Hall be converted, uh, one to a 15 minute uh, free uh, high turnover space and two to regular metered spaces. We think those are the most appropriate uh, uses of those spaces, particularly at the main entrance to the town hall and across the street from a number of uh, restaurants and other retail establishments. Second set of recommendations uh, adds three uh, 15 minute high turnover free parking spaces uh, at uh, th uh, three additional locations, uh, one I just mentioned near the main entrance of Town Hall on Main Street, uh, one in the uh, Lower Bangs lot behind uh, uh, Rayo's Coffee, and then one on Amity Street uh, next to the Jones Library near the Book Drop. Uh, uh, third set of recommendations, uh, create some late night taxi stands. One of the things we heard as we were working on taxi regulations uh, in the latter half of 2012 was a need for a greater number of taxi stands, particularly at high demand times. I have a recommendation to repurpose five metered spaces on the east side of South Pleasant Street in the area between the Spring Street parking lot and the Main Street parking lot. Uh, to late night taxi stands, Thursday, Fridays, and Saturday nights from 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Um, they would remain regular metered spaces at all other times, but uh, that is a high demand time for taxi services in the downtown. Uh, that is also a safer location in terms of pedestrian and vehicle uh, access uh, at that location. Um, uh, next, uh, number four, uh, minimum charge. Uh, this is common, uh, a common uh, item. Uh, we didn't have this here. For the multi-space meter machines, when you're paying with a 
with plastic debit or credit card. Uh, having a minimum uh, charge of, of uh, uh, two hours. It's basically a minimum charge of a dollar uh, to use those machines. And the basic purpose of that is to uh, not lose money on the transaction, uh, not really gain much money, but not lose money either on a very short term uh, transaction given the cost of uh, fees, et cetera, with credit cards. Uh, fifth, a couple of uh, recommendations related to town center permit parking. Uh, this would uh, have the north side of Spring Street between Boltwood Avenue and Churchill Street, which is the block uh, on either side with uh, Lord Jeff on the, on the south side and Grace Church uh, on the, on the uh, north side. Uh, that would convert to town center permit parking Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, the meter heads would remain and, and can be used as a metered parking at all times, but during the weekday it would also be used for uh, town center permit holders. And what we have found since we converted to exclusively metered parking there was that the utilization uh, has been very, very low during the daytime, creating some other kind of domino uh, issues in terms of uh, overcrowding on the permit parking uh, further down Spring Street and some of those other side streets. So this will allow more of that space to be used more often uh, during, during the, the weekday uh, time. Uh, the second uh, item related to town center permit parking is a recommendation to uh, convert the south side of Gaylord Street uh, from unrestricted parking to town center permit parking, which are sold to residents or, or those who work in the downtown, uh, which again would be applicable Monday through Friday, uh, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, having some ongoing discussions with uh, many of the uh, property owners and others in the Gaylord Street neighborhood, and there's been an issue, a concern expressed about uh, the narrowness of the street, which is which is which is uh, obvious, but um, concern about uh, parking and ease of access uh, up and down the street, and in particular, being able to get out of one's driveway in a, in a in a reasonably, uh, uh, you know, safe and uh, uh, way. Uh, and so we're working at the staff level uh, with Public Works. Uh, and public safety to finalize uh, a detailed set of parking and no parking uh, uh, areas along Gaylord Street that uh, is sensitive to that need for an appropriate uh, turning radius for those who are uh, attempting to navigate that street or even get out of their own driveway. Um, number six, uh, a couple of recommendations related to Boltwood Garage reserve parking. Uh, we have reserve parking in the lower level. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of recommendations here. Increasing by three the number of reserve spaces in the lower level uh, to a total of 28, but also increasing the annual rate for reserve spaces from $750 per year to $850 per year, uh, which would be the first such increase in nearly two years. Um, lastly, uh, we are recommending uh, an introduction of a new parking lot permit option uh, for regular parkers in our downtown. This would create a, a, an, a, a new permit program for weekday parking uh, during business hours, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, you would be able to purchase uh, using any metered space in the lower level of the Boltwood garage uh, for a sticker that you would have put on your side window of your vehicle. Uh, that would cost $600 per year. Uh, if you wanted to add Saturday mornings to that, uh, you could do that for an additional $25. We want to offer the same uh, option in the town portion of the CVS lot, uh, which is a lesser used lot. Uh, that would be $400 per year, uh, and also an additional $25 if you add uh, add Saturday. We think uh, that will encourage uh, a 
and might encourage some of the reserve uh, pass holders to convert to a, a, a weekday pass instead, which we think over a, a longer term can free up some spaces, uh, particularly at the peak, uh, uh, peak time, such as the dinner hour uh, in the uh, Boltwood garage area. So I'll stop there. Okay, so uh, so folks know um, this is a public hearing, so the way this will proceed is the select board will start with questions and comments, then we will go to the public for questions and comments. Um, when we're all done questioning and commenting, uh, we'll close the public hearing and then deliberate. So just a technical thing before we get started. Um, and, and for both of those, I'll go in order because that makes the most sense um, in dealing with them one issue at a time. But before we do that, item number seven, the parking lot permit parking was not actually part of the agenda. Um, so this has been noticed as a public hearing. I'm not sure if the wording of the noticing of the public hearing will cover that or not. So I would recommend that the select board proceed with it and then we ask town council if it is legitimate or not. And if it is not, then we'll re-notice that part of it and, and uh, consider it again. Okay. So. Okay, um, it, it's possible that all these things are covered, but just to, 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 to be on the safe side so that we know that we're doing this appropriately. Okay, so starting at the beginning, um, commercial loading zones, select board members, Ms. Brewer. Um, yes, and thank you for the maps in, in the packet. They're helpful, although flipping back and forth sometimes with little blue dots is a little funny too to try and figure out. So with the new commercial loading zone that's just west of the PVTA bus stop, that's a 24-7 CLZ as opposed to an AM only CLZ as per the map. I want to make sure I got my shades of blue right. Yes. All right. And then the re one of, some of the things that we're removing in the commercial loading zone um, are currently the 6.30 to 11.30 AM, and that's what's considered the AM commercial loading zone. Those still exist a couple of other places in town, and those are noted, and I've seen the sign, but yes. people always get confused. Does that mean I'm really allowed to park there after those hours? And the answer is yes. Right. But if it just says commercial loading zone, the answer is no. Right. Okay. Got it. Other questions and comments about commercial loading zones? Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I'm just curious. Uh, are these responding to specific requests? I mean, I see the trucks out there all the time, and, and they stack up at every once in a while. Um, but is that where this comes from? Uh, we think the uh, new, the addition is a safer spot. Mm. Um, um, and um, the remaining commercial loading zones, including ones that were added down by the black sheep, uh, and there's one across the street on Main Street um, as well that those are, you know, heavily used and uh, the most, I don't know if, I guess you could describe the most popular one being the one on the other side of Main Street, on the retail block side of the street near the sidewalk, the handicapped accessible sidewalk. So it's easier to unload, load, uh, unload from the trucks and, and service the various businesses there. The questions or comments on commercial <coughs> loading zones? Um, I was, uh, I, I mean, clearly the answer is yes, but um, I, I was curious about the location of the new one. Um, it's not next to anything, and people would have to cross the street. The, the truck drivers would have to cross the street with, with all their goods, so they're not actually near anything they would be delivering to. And I know that there is, um, uh, there's like, uh, handrail going along a, a significant part of that. Um, did did you sort of you, you considered all those things and still thought it was a good idea, right? <laughs> yeah, I would ask Claire McGinnis. Uh. Um, the use of that space in particular is already happening, so this formalizes what we already know that um, drivers find that space useful and convenient. It's always open because it's parking for no other purpose. Uh, what they are near is several crosswalks that gets them to businesses. Okay. Um, and th my other question was, is th that's a, the commercial loading zone is an expensive ticket. 
Um, and I was wondering if there's any way to call attention to the change, because some people are parking there as regular parking these days. So if this is going to be a change that suddenly you're going to get a very expensive ticket, um, is there any way to call attention to that or, or have like a grace period of getting a, you know, a different kind of ticket um, for, for some amount of time? I'm just, because that is an expensive ticket, right? It is an expensive, one of the more expensive tickets and what we talked about was a round of notice with our business partners and merchants at downtown saying hey we have new commercial loading zone um, and then a round of warnings and then a round of um, and then actually getting out to ticketing um, because the net change is fewer uh, for retail users there's actually more space available which means fewer tickets, less confusion, because there are fewer spaces marked commercial loading zone after these changes compared to b before. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. All right, anything else? Uh, Ms. Stein, then Ms. Brewer. No, it's the other one. She had her hand up first. <laughs> she already asked a question, though. So she you already have to go asked next. a question. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, I was wondering about the idea of maybe having a commercial loading zone in the uh, area the parking spaces next to say Johnny's because the trucks are often standing there blocking three or four parking places for people trying to get into bangs so I wondered if that had been considered as a place for a commercial loading zone. Um, there's really not room and because of the um, deck of the garage there's a wear issue and a facility um, what's the right word John there's a facility management problem that we don't, we're not gonna encourage heavy trucks on the deck. We know that it happens, but it, it is wearing out the f that facility faster than it should be if we could try to keep trucks off it. So we tried to protect the commercial loading zones near the tunnel and also near the lower level by Clark House, not Clark House, Webster House, um, the lower access that goes along Boltwood Walk. So we didn't take away anything there um, because we are going to try to encourage trucks to stay off the deck. Ms. Brewer. I have become confused, and so I'm hoping we can clarify this. So this new commercial loading zone, right, and you were, that's to the west of the PVTA, I can picture the bus shelter very easily. So what's there right now are meters? There's nothing there. Nothing there. Right. There's nothing there, so technically... Who's parking there now? I'm confused by that. Oh, so maybe, so I was assuming we were turning spaces into commercial loading zone, but, but, that, we're but I'm wrong. not, so what does that mean? It's, it's so being used unofficially and has been for a long time as a loading zone. But it's not actually marked it's as parking spaces. not marked or signed. Correct. Right. That solves oh, many that problems. problems. So it's Thank on you. the street side of the median where the meters are for Main Street lot, but it's on the street side. So we're and creating a parking space now. where there hadn't been one, so you don't have to worry about what I was saying. And, and oh, right. evidently, PBTA is not worried about pulling around trucks. They're good, and they have truck lots truck. to practice. Because they're already because there. Because it's been done unofficially been for a long time. Got it. And the street is wide enough where it works. Not currently marked for parking. Thank you. All right, anything else on loading zones? 15-minute parking spaces. Ms. Stein. They're great. I'm glad we're adding them. I think they've, yeah. they're really useful to town, uh, downtown businesses. And, um, and I can tell you that uh, of all the various recommendations that I talked about with the Business Improvement District folks, they were most enthusiastic about adding the 15-minute spaces because they agree that that's been a very, very favorably received by people who want to do business in the downtown. Any other questions or comments about 15-minute parking? Okay, taxi stands. Uh, I'll get to the public after, sorry. Ms. Brewer. She's shooting her hand up. So, okay, I didn't go over and look at the signs again recently, but the taxi stands, that won't be the late night thing, because that won't interfere with meters at all, because obviously nobody's putting money in the meters at that time. But the two that remain next to the little yellow house, yeah. so they just say taxi stand. What does that mean to me as someone who's driving? Does that mean I'm not supposed to park there ever? It means it's a reserved space for taxis only. Do we have, do we run into a lot of people parking there who end up getting tickets? I mean, 
I'm asking you just off the top of your head rather than to, you know, actually do the research because I don't want you to waste the time. But those signs have become a little disheveled over time, and I'm not sure that people really grasp what they are there. The only time I see this in uh, violations is during the farmer's market. Ah, okay. That makes sense because, of course, they're, they're 24 7 signs. Right. Okay. Thank you. We may just need to update the signage. Are there questions or comments on taxi stands? Um, so, it, is the violation for parking there ticketing, not towing, just ticketing in, tar in a taxi stand? Correct. Okay. Um, the, um, again, that'll be a weird one with the signage because that's going to be different for folks. So you're going to have things that are taxi stands all the time and things that turn to taxi stands at 11 o'clock. So that will be. For three nights a week. Yeah. So, so it'll be marked. It'll be signed that way. In a way that I'm sure we'll find perfectly clear, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yes. my sarcasm font. Yeah. Okay. Sure. All right. It makes sense, logically. It's just the signage I'm a little worried about. Um, and were taxi stands considered closer to the actual bar area? Like this is having people go, you know, if you figure that most of the folks are going to UMass, though that's not 100% the case, that's making them go the opposite direction to get it. Yeah, we talked about that. Um, it's very close to where you might expect a large number of pedestrians to be out at that hour. Um, but this was developed in in with lots of feedback from the Amherst police about uh, uh, le uh, inappropriate double, p double, triple parking by taxis, you know, looking for customers. It just encourages kind of a congregation of people to remain as opposed to having them all, if they want a taxi, going to a designated spot that is nearby. Uh, you know, there's also things like the... Uh, you know, there's the regular PVTA stop that has some late night service a little farther down by the post office, and the uh, uh, you know the uh, sober shuttle that's been introduced this semester, which picks up passengers down by uh, Kellogg, by the uh, by the post office as well, for that you know that concept of people naturally walking in that direction. Right. Ms. Burr. Right. Speaking of signage, because it, unless they're going back to Amherst College, they're walking, as you said, away from UMass. So can we put a sign out by Antonio's or something in that general vicinity that says taxis that way? I mean, how else would they possibly know that the taxis are the opposite direction of where they're going? It, in terms of, I know that the problem is right now the taxis are pulling up and taking them, and then it's not a problem. They don't have to find them because the taxis are right there. Uh, but. This is a team effort that includes uh, part of the team are the taxi operators that we license and having their cooperation to uh, go to those designated spots, which they will have the, for the first time. Um, it's a team effort to make it work. And then the word of mouth, if you need a cab, cross, cross Main Street and you, know, you got hopefully five waiting there for you. Right, that's what I was trying friends. to understand, is how to, how to tell those folks as they're right. pouring out of various buildings to go that direction instead. Yep. Okay. All right, anything else on taxi stands? Mm. Minimum charge. All right, so I have a question about that. So uh, do we have data on the usage of credit cards and <coughs> how many, uh, it kind of in general, and how many of the credit card or percentage really up are, are coming in at lower than, than the minimum you're looking for? Um, like, do lots of people use I credit I did cards? this analysis, but I <laughs> forgot to look at it again today. Um, I did this analysis when I first presented the idea to John and Sandy. Um, our most frequent swipe is under a dollar right now, which is less than a two-hour purchase. Um, and when it's a cost-to-revenue ratio, changes dramatically at the two-hour purchase. So that was um, how we chose this. Um, price point or purchase point. Um, I'll have to get it to you. 
because my concern is that the uh, that's a major convenience. So I'm wondering how many people were inconveniencing, and and that was to me a real selling point with the new machines. Is you don't need to have a coin all the time. So if suddenly you're going to say, all right, you, you use a credit card for kind of a minimum purchase, that that significantly eliminates the convenience factor. And I wonder if we maybe we're willing to subsidize the convenience because um, that that was a big part of making the change. Well, we're subsidizing the convenience with every swipe because every swipe has a uh, merchant fee, which um, is over 25 cents per swipe. So we need to do something. And um, this was the point where the ratio indicated, just said right there, that's where you need to target your minimum purchase. Ms. Brewer. I'm glad you brought that up because that's exactly the way I feel in terms of we were trying to say, oh, you can do it on your phone, oh, you can do this, you can do that, it's going to be so easy. Don't worry about having the quarters. And I know it's only a few quarters, but it's still quarters people don't have to have. I think that especially given that the signage for credit card, credit card users are, seem to be even more typically confused than cash users in, in my absolutely anecdotal experience walking around town. So is it possible as we go through this and we, we get to the point of voting that we could choose to take pieces out of this in order to delay them for consideration at another time? Um, yes, we absolutely, I don't know what the motion says, but we need to vote on everything separately and certainly we could, we okay. could remove anything we're not ready to vote. I, I would just say on this, and I get the points that, that people are expressing, uh, the notion of a minimum charge is commonplace in public parking facilities, what is much less common is how low our parking rates are uh, for a charge system. And so we're, tr we're, we're offering the uh, credit card convenience, but at a very, very low hourly rate, which we want to preserve that low uh, hourly rate. And uh, we're hoping, and I think it's natural that over time, uh, the percentage of users w using uh, plastic uh, will grow as it is in uh, and many other types of transactions that people make nowadays is much less currency floating around the system. Um, but it is a cost of doing business, um, and it just seemed eminently reasonable to me uh, on, on a situation like this. The, um, the statistics I did look at today, I can tell you that 30% of the revenue is through those metered machines is in the form of a card swipe. Um, and that's very consistent over the entire year and a half that we've been using them. Thank you. Ms. Stein. The only thing I was going to say is I don't have a problem with the minimum charge because if you go into the black sheet, there's a minimum. If you go into the bakery, the Henyon, there's a minimum. Nobody, none of the merchants want you to use a credit card below a certain amount. So a two-hour... Um, purchase doesn't <coughs> seem onerous to me. Okay. Other questions or comments on minimum charge? Ms. Brewer. Since we don't actually have the rate chart here, I'm sure someone remembers off the top of their head that it's 50 cents in the machines. Yes. Mm -hmm. So two hours is two bucks. One dollar. It's one dollar, right. $1. See, this is why I do the, <laughs> this is why I do the finance <laughs> stuff, you know? So, right, so two hours, all right, so you're looking right. purely at because I think that's an important context to give people. Because Spending a minimum of a dollar chart. when you park, if you're paying with a credit card, that's that's what we're talking about. Okay. If I could just point out, if you don't set a minimum, you're almost better off not charging for parking because we lose money on every transaction. So that's why we did look at where the uh, the cutoffs were and the arcane world of credit card pricing and and it gets pretty it can get expensive it can be Claire said 25 cents but sometimes it's 50 cents for every swipe um, it just depends on what kind of credit card you're using so we did not want to be in a position where the town is losing money every time it does a transaction and and that's why we came up with this minimum thank you okay other things questions or comments on minimum charge all right, uh, town center permit parking. Questions or comments? Ms. Brewer. Oh, come on. I'm so boring. Um, the, where it talks about, and, and I totally 
appreciated your explanation on Spring Street and how you, you know, you may as well let permit parking be there as well if it's not getting used with the meters. Do we do that anyplace else? Just wondering about, you know, as our system continues to evolve, do we, we don't have that anyplace else. Yeah. But, I mean, it's the, this is actually an easy one in terms of the change because you just tell, you know who your permit users are. So you can tell your permit users, by the way, you can park over there now, which is a lot easier than just saying to the general public, guess what, right. now you can park. Yeah, we give them all a map. And I know that from early on after the conversion to metered spaces, we've heard some feedback that, boy, we wish that could be reconsidered for permit parking. And, and the idea of being able to be either, I think, makes yes. a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You know, I, I had missed that the first time around, that, that you could continue to use meters there. That's very interesting. So the, the park enforcement folks are okay with that? That's a reasonably efficient thing to do? Yes. Okay. Weird, but okay. Other <laughs> questions on town center <laughs> permit parking? Okay. Uh, Boltwood Garage Reserve Parking. Okay. Let's see. I've got, whoops. Um, so I was just interested in the rates. I like the idea that we're increasing them, and I would like to see us increase them, them sort of regularly to see what the what the tipping point is. I checked Northampton just to be curious. Um, they charge ninety dollars per month for their reserved spaces and have a waiting list. Um, so that comes out to more than a thousand dollars a year. So I, I really think that when you're when you're basically reserving, you're, you're leasing a piece of town real estate, you should also have the convenience factor built in. So I'm not sure. Usually when you buy things sort of in bulk, you get a discount. But this time, so I can see you'd get the discount. That's cheaper than if you were to pay for parking on all of those hours. But, um, but I think there's a convenience factor of um, you never have to look for a space and you're, you're basically you know, buying a piece of town real estate for that amount of time that um, I, I would think that the price point could be higher, but uh, but I'm, I'm glad to see it being increased and I can I can see how we might want to, you know, kind of continue to monitor the situation. I think you want to, I think you want the price to be as high as possible before you end up losing uh, spaces. You know, once you have a vacancy, then you know that you're, you've just hit that point, but... Ms. Brewer. Since you've done a bunch of analysis associated with this, and I'm not going to put you on the spot, but if you remember, that's totally fine if you don't, um, with eliminating the monthly rate, it seems like it would be much simpler to just go ahead and charge people for a year. Have we had issues with people who say they want the parking space but then don't pay on in a timely fashion and then we don't know what to do with their space if they're really going to pay for it or not? We do get into that more with the monthly payers, um, but the reality is that right now of the 25 spaces, only one person is going month to month. Okay, um, so that's really so good to we, know. So this is just sort of... It's easy for them, too. Okay. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Other questions about Boltwood Garage Reserve parking? All right. Parking lot permit parking. So this is a totally new concept. Very different. Ms. Brewer? Because <laughs> I'm desperate to ask these questions. So this is like, yeah, thanks. Good luck to the parking enforcement people is all I can say. There's lots of different things for them to keep in track of now. So I just want to be clear that we are talking about, it's, it is very specific. So even though we're set, it's called parking lot permit parking, it's the Boltwood Garage lower level permit parking during the day or it's the town CVS lot, like your chart says here. It's not you know, any parking lot. People should not get confused. It's these very specific spaces that are underutilized and that we think we can do this with. That's exactly it, because during the weekdays, the lower level of the garage and some portions of the town CVS lot are the, have a high vacancy rate. So we want to encourage more regular parkers to use those spaces as opposed to the prime spots that you know turn customers who might want to come in and do business and, and be conveniently next to the shop have greater access to those spaces. Right. So following up on that, again, since we just don't happen to have the chart with me, and obviously I can't even add fifty cents at this point, is um, what is the since this is another kind of permit, we know how much the reserve parking is in the garage. The current town center permits that, because what I'm looking at is this is an alternative for an employee. 
So an employee might be feeding a meter, an employee might be um, buying one of these day permits, or an employee might be buying a town center permit. What's the, what's the price, you know, just to give me a context of, I mean, obviously I sure. know you came up with this for a good reason, but. Um, so I did the math and 250 business days a year, if you were here for six hours a day, at 50 cents an hour, that's $750. Nice. If you are somebody who arrives at two to work um, a late lunch into a dinner hour, um, obviously it's less. If you're somebody who has a true business day and is here for eight hours, that's $1,000. So it's a significant, um, if somebody was truly trying to keep up with meters for all of that time, this is significantly discounted. The beauty, well, the it's the beauty, but it's the reason that we identified these two areas as permit parking, as John said, is because they're mostly vacant. So it's encouraging people to get into lesser used space. The other way I looked at this pricing is what do, the, what do those spaces make us right now in revenue and try to re replace. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a money maker for us, but it's a replacement trying to encourage people to get into our underutilized space, as well as to park legally because they don't have to repeatedly feed the meter all day and um, well, I mean, get rid yeah. of the hassle factor of having to go out to the meter repeatedly. Absolutely. And then how does it compare to if they're, if, if they're weighing their options, which hopefully they're not feeding meters, but they're looking at this, and then they're also looking at a town center permit, say they don't, live, they don't work exactly close to one of these. What's a town center permit run people these days? Only $25. So the difference is this is priced this way because it's a shorter walk. Because it's right in there, right. as opposed to being in the outlying right. areas. Right. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Other questions or comments on permit parking lot permit parking? All right, now I will open it up to the public for question and comments, and we will again start at the beginning because that's easiest. Uh, commercial loading zones. Nobody cares about commercial loading zones. 15 minute parking spaces. Mr. Crograbe, please come forward and identify yourself. Alex Crograbe, Executive Director of the Amherst Business Improvement District. Um, I'm, I think this is a great recommendation. As many of these are, I'll address them one at a time as we're doing. Um, but in general, I, I applaud the work of the town staff in, in putting <coughs> these together and um, I hope that we can have more changes to policy in the future, but the 15 minute spaces, as the town manager said, was one of the strongest recommendations from the bid. Um, three is great. I think even more might be good in the future, but we'll, we'll see where, see how it goes with this. Um, but this has been loud and clear from businesses, so. Thank you very much. Anyone else on 15 minute parking? All right, taxi stands. Minimum charge for the credit card. Mr. Krograbe. I just had a question about this. Um, is the maximum amount of time on the lots, is that two hours in some places as well? Four hours at the... For the parking lots, it's place. four hours. Okay. So main and spring is two. And oh, yeah, right. right. Uh, four oh. and yeah. Three. So then on main and spring, the minimum and maximum would be the same amount. So there's only one purchase you can make on those. Um, by card. By card, yes. Um, on, on this, as on many matters with parking, I think we should keep convenience in mind very strongly because um, one of the, the bid's concerns about parking downtown is that people don't want to come downtown because they think parking is too much of a hassle. So if, you know, I don't, I don't have feelings about this other way. I think, you know, town staff is doing a good job at analyzing this stuff, but um, it sort of seems confusing in some places for um, the lots to have a minimum charge, and then in some places for it to be the only charge you can make on your card. Um, just we should make sure we're keeping convenience in mind as well as finances. Okay. Thank you. Uh, town center permit parking. This involves Gaylord Street. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
are you, sir, are you also Overall, looking to come in? So I, I need to know what you're doing first before yes, we uh, get into this. So. <laughs> Show us Gaylord Street, I suspect. You need to come forward and speak at the mic, please. Yeah, I, just, I was going to make a few introductory remar remarks uh, ahead of uh, Colin there. I'm Dennis Porter. I live at the bottom of Gaylord Street, uh, number 33. And I would just like to uh, draw your attention to our handout, which I believe we have. Yep. And to underline the few points in it, um, Mr. Musanti has already gone over the ground to some extent of the problems of parking on Gaylord Street. I would just like to uh, underline the fact that uh, this is an old and narrow street with all these cutouts, uh, with these telephone poles, and uh, lots of problems and narrow driveways tr from which you try and exit onto the street with a car right in <coughs> front of you. And you've probably only got about eight feet at most between you and your car and you take tight turns. These are the sort of issues and it gets worse when there are banks of snow. Um, but basically, I should perhaps remind you that the, why this is a problem now when it wasn't a few years ago is for two reasons. First of all, they have uh, you know, town center permit parking up to uh, South, uh, South Prospect Street. Gaylord comes off that, so that pushed people down to park on our street to begin with. And then about 18 months ago, we had this uh, very fine um, sidewalk put in place, which is about twice as wide as the original sidewalk and berms on the other side, which does a great job for drainage, and it's nice to be able to walk up that sidewalk. However, it does mean the street is now three feet narrower than it ever was before, which you can see how the problem accumulates. Um, I'd make a couple of other points. First, um, we understand the church, a Hope Church may have somewhat different interests here. But as far as we're concerned, certainly as far as I'm concerned, Hope Church is and has always been and remains a good neighbor. So we want it to flourish. Uh, when about 10 years ago or something like that, the idea was that Hope Church may move to North Amherst, I was horrified. And I have to say, I was very happy that they stayed on Gaylord Street. So in that sense, we, you know, we don't want in any way to disfavor or antagonize the church. But we do feel that they use, you know, they're mostly there on Sundays, obviously, and on Saturdays. And perhaps, possibly, arrangements could be made for them on other days if this seems to be necessary. So that's basically what I wanted to say. Thank you. So if you give, a, a, give an overview, give a sense of what your pr presentation is it's, so we can see how much of this uh, we need. Our presentation is covering the details of what uh, uh, Dennis has described. Um, my name is Colin Hill. I live at 15 Gaylord Street. You can Street. tilt that towards me. <clears throat> my name is Colin Hill. I live at 15 Gaylord Street. The, uh, the issue is, as Dennis described, uh, an issue of roadway width. And because the roadway is what it is, that is between 16 and 17 feet wide, what we're dealing with here is a road that is unsuitable for parking of any kind. You can make a legitimate argument that this roadway is suitable for no parking and barely suitable for two-way traffic at 17 feet, as the minimum for two-way traffic is 18 feet. And you can get the DPW's input on this, they'll tell you that they want one-way traffic or no parking. I gotta tell you, one-way traffic isn't gonna solve a problem here uh, related to width because you still have one lane of traffic, which we have now, and one lane of vehicles. Um, the standard width for a parking, a parallel parking space, which right now are unmarked and, and essentially a, a haphazard implementation on, on the street, 
uh, is 15 feet by nine feet nationally. Uh, Amherst luckily has a slightly narrower standard at 20 feet by eight feet. To do the math here, you end up with between eight and nine feet of drivable roadway. Now, unfortunately, the state of Massachusetts says that's not suitable for any lanes of traffic whatsoever. Uh, parking is not suitable for uh, roads where you don't have a passing distance of more than 10 feet. Um, now, there are other concerns. There are a number of uh, elderly residents on the street. Uh, and of course, anyone would find the need for fire and emergency vehicle transit on the, on the roadway. Um, the operative standard for this, and this is not a regulation, this is a standard um, favored by uh, Fire Chief Tim Nelson and uh, other fire departments around the country. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, that standard uh, defines 12 feet minimum uh, transit between any parked cars and uh, on the roadway uh, and the side of the roadway. Um, and of course, if you talk to any uh, safety personnel, they'll tell you, don't worry, we can drive on the sidewalk. Well, that's great, unless you got telephone poles there, because I guarantee you a telephone pole is gonna fare better than my car. It's also gonna fare better than a fire engine, unfortunately. Um, the, uh, the facts are that, the, but what it amounts to is we recognize the importance of Hope Church in the community. We recognize that they don't have any private parking of their own in their, near their facility, and we wanna try and accommodate them. So in spite of the fact that it's highly dangerous to have parking on the street, <laughs> um, we want to make sure that it is possible. So we have a proposal. We ask that regardless of uh, whether the board votes up, and up or down the uh, town center permit parking for Gaylord Street, we ask that provision be made for safe parking on the street. That is, uh, we would effectively need to remove a number of spaces, unfortunately, <coughs> uh, because as I said, parking tends to be haphazard on the street now. Um, on a bad day, you'll see 20, 25, 30 cars on this street, uh, whereas, uh, and Mr. Pisanti, you may be able to correct me on this, uh, DPW envisions 18 parking spaces on the street. Is that a correct number? Uh, we're, we're still working out those details. No, I mean, currently, yeah. in, in the current configuration. It's in that range. It's yeah. in that range. Yeah. But not 20, not 25, and not 30. Um, so when you have 20, 25, 30 cars on the street, you end up with vehicles, uh, and if you turn your attention to the monitor, uh, right along the street, the, the entire length of the street, blocking uh, and infringing on driveways both on the uh, same side as parking and also on the opposite side of parking. Now, um, the issue with vehicles on the opposite side of a driveway on a 17, and unfortunately we're having some technical difficulties here. Um, unfortunate. Um, bear with me one moment. The, the issue with having uh, vehicles on, and I need to reserve lights on this. Yeah, you So, Mr. Hill, while you're dealing with oh. your technology, let me um, um, let me just uh, kind of summarize where I think this this issue is. Yeah. So, we have the question in front of us about whether to change this to town center permit parking. Yeah. Um, the but select board doesn't really get into the specific safety yeah. issues per space, um, and as Mr. Musanti has noted, town staff is already working with uh, the residents to try and designate which spaces are safe. So. I think that the select board is going to 
leave that to I, town staff to continue to work that out. I don't think that's an issue for us to be um, considering at this point. You're correct. What I'm a what we're asking as uh, the residents uh, as a whole are asking, and uh, earlier we had a slide up with the names of those we represent. Um, is we're asking that the board recommend to the DPW to take care to uh, ensure safe turning radiuses on uh, into and out of driveways on the street because it is such a narrow street. The intersection formed by the driveway and the roadway itself uh, is unavoidable if you were to park opposite that driveway. So simply saying you may not park opposite a driveway, you you know, and provide a radius, uh, an area around that driveway on both sides of the road, will serve the safety goals that we were hoping to serve. So we're looking for a recommendation from the board uh, to the DPW in that regard. Okay. Um, the packet that you have uh, details what I was hoping to demonstrate uh, here. Um, You'll see on page two uh, breakouts <coughs> of the uh, uh, turning radiuses, uh, these using turning radius overlays provided by the Department of Public Works. This is the standard method by which they uh, determine the turning radiuses out of, out of driveways and intersections. Uh, and as you can see, we've positioned vehicles uh, outside those turning radiuses such that safe uh, ingress and egress from park, from driveways can be maintained even during maximum parking per, uh, times when the fo when the street is fully occupied. Okay, within, so I understand your recommendation. Space. We need to move this along a yes. bit more. So if the select board is looking to get into that degree of detail with its recommendation, then we'll ask you more questions about it. But we um, certainly so we'll call you back during the deliberation if we if we have more questions about that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Time. Thank you for all your information. Yes, sir. In the back, if you could come forward, and please identify yourself. My name is Mario DePillis, uh, Jr., 27 Gaylord Street. Um, and I support uh, what Colin just uh, said about the uh, need for radius, radii or driving radii. But also, uh, I don't have a problem getting out of my driveway because I have a fire hydrant opposite me, and so I don't have a problem. But I would like to see that the church uh, get parking permits uh, as, as a part of this, and perhaps additional parking permits um, during weekdays, uh, and if they need to, should be asked if they need more, and they should be granted more. <clears throat> so there's a minimal amount that are, so if you do vote for the parking permits, which I don't have a opinion on, I would like them to have more, even if today, even if they don't, if you don't vote for the parking permits for that, for that street, it would be nice for them to have more parking available to them. So mm -hmm. even today, they would be, I think they would benefit from parking permits. Okay, That's thank it. you very much. Other folks want to have comment on the town center permit parking? Okay, Boltwood Garage Reserve Parking. Mr. Crow Grabby, no, you're good with that. Anyone else? All right, parking lot permit parking. All right, then at this time, I will Take a motion to close the public <coughs> hearing at 8.03. I would move to close the public hearing at 8.03. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay, so now it's select board deliberation. Yeah. Um, so we can still ask <laughs> questions for any clarification that we need during <coughs> this period. Um, so I think taking these uh, one by one is, is easiest because that lets us know where we have issues. So commercial loading zones. Anybody have anything but support for the commercial loading zone recommendation? Okay, 15 minute parking spaces. Good, taxi stands. Minimum charge. So I don't like the minimum charge thing. I think we've got serious convenience issues. I, I can appreciate that we are upside down in that um, financing model, but considering the whole point and, and, and particularly um, the idea that 30% of the usage is currently coming from credit cards, um, that seems like a, a, a significant number of people who are taking 
advantage of that convenience factor that we've given them. And um, I, I just, I don't know what the implications of that would be. I think that, I think that that was such a selling point of the machines. Um, that's a concern. So I'm not sure if it would be better to just rethink that part of the recommendation or to just vote it up or down. Um, but I can't support it in its current, I can't support it as is. What do other people think? Ms. Brewer and then Ms. Trayden. I was going to recommend, I, I wasn't quite clear on exactly how our process was going here, but I was going to recommend that we remove it for con reconsideration. And I mean, not, I, I'm not going to tie our hands by saying we have to do it at a future time, but my intent behind it would be another period of time with some additional signage about just how to use the bloody card in the first place and then revisiting as part of potentially, in my mind, the whole two, three, four, eight hour issue as well. So um, I would be fine with removing it from tonight's consideration. Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I, I, I kind of like the idea to table it as well, uh, partly because I'm very slow on the uptake and I made the motion before I had the question and now I have the question, which may not have been answerable tonight anyway. Uh, and that is how um, switching um, the, um, the cell phone network will affect that usage. Um, right now it's extremely difficult because of the waiting times and certain uncertainty about some of what the screens are really saying, which the sign will help, but um, it's not convenient to use a credit card right now. Uh, in fact, it's darn near impossible. I tried it once and couldn't figure it out, but that's maybe because I don't park that often. I, I don't know. Any event, so I like the idea of tabling it until we can figure out what's happening with that. I imagine the 3G will speed it up, that more people will want to use it, and I don't know if that affects the charges either at the same time. So. So it, d it does mean that presumably the more people use it, the more trouble we'll have with the pricing of our parking. It'll, it will well, be. It'll help the if the screen doesn't go blank for two minutes at a time. That that's, <laughs> that would be a nice feature. That's fine. I, I'm wondering if we can get some data that would help us resolve this issue, and that is if there is any way that Ms. McGinnis could break down credit card charges for the last month at least and say, well, this was for two hours, this was for <coughs> half an hour. I mean, if, if we, it's 30%, sounds like a lot of people using it, but it may not be um, for tiny uh, amounts of time. And the thing is, I think the credit card option is a convenience, and I don't think it should end up costing the town money. That's, that's my concern about this. So I wonder, <coughs> is there a way we can get more data about are people really using credit cards for like 35 cents or you know a very um, ridiculously small amount we can get that data to you so maybe we could table this till we have the data okay mr wall yeah i think tabling is good too because it is a question of can i understand the town's concern about the money but it is convenient because often you don't have change and you got to pay for parking I mean, I suppose ideally you'd have a machine that gave you change there, or an ATM, or a system that stored parking on a card, or maybe you could create 15-minute free spaces in these lots for those who would pay otherwise 25 cents. You know, there, might, there may, may be other ways around the problem that wouldn't resolve this, but I think right now we can't solve it, so I'd be happy with tabling it. Okay. It's an interesting point about the, um, the change machines, which I think we got rid of as part of the change to the parking machines. Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I think... No, <laughs> they're still there. <laughs> I thought we were going to get rid of them. Um, so it, it just strikes me as really a fundamental change to the concept of having gotten the machines um, for their convenience factor. And I just think we need to be looking at it, not just at, at the money part. And maybe there's a way that, that the money part can be made up in some other way. I'm not sure what that is, but, uh, but it just that that's a fundamental change. So, okay. So I think we have agreement to table that for until we have more data, bring that back. Okay. Town center permit parking, Mr. Walt. Maybe just for the sake of the viewing audience, could we explain what the current parking situation on Gaylord is? Thank you. <laughs> it's very helpful. It, I know the street very well and I understand the problems. It's very narrow and it's hard to park there. Uh, Right now, it's uh, two-way traffic, and there's no parking on the north side of Gaylord. And there is unrestricted parking 
on the south side. So in other words, we're, what we're doing here is not really going to address the issue. Right now, you can park there already. The theory behind the town center permit is that your eligibility for those permits are if you're a resident of the street right. or work in the downtown. But I mean, we're not debating the actual location of parking spaces, which is the concern of the residents. Not in this motion. Other questions or comments on town center permit? Ms. Brewer. So currently, it's similar to where we're putting in the new commercial 24 7 commercial loading zone in that or perhaps even less so, and the, there aren't meters there now. There's no permit parking there now. And on the north side, it has signs that says no parking at any time, period. And on the south side, it's just unmarked, and it's just a street, and whoever parks there, parks there. I can understand why we would like to have some more spaces set aside for town center permit parking. It's always nice to have many choices for people. Um, do we have any indication at this point that it's getting filled up with something else that we don't want to be there? Or is it just that the spaces are underutilized? And so that's why we want it. I, I'm not sure how we got to this point. I think it was an attempt to uh, reduce the utilization of parking by outsiders there. Okay. okay. So the p town permit parking would potentially be full of town permit parkers or people might find that to be not a convenient place to park um, right. anyway. Okay. So we'll either be getting money for the parking that's happening there already in the, in the form of town center permit or, um, or not. Or no one will park there, which is okay too. In right, if nobody, right, because right. nobody, nobody right. wants to park there with a permit. Okay. Um, so, so to the points that the neighbors have brought up, so no one has, uh, no one has offered any um, concern about the town center permit part of this. It's only the spaces themselves. Um, so I feel uh, confident in asking the town to continue to work out what safe parking would be on that road. Um, Particularly, I can see how the changes that were made in the last two years have, have significantly changed the, the facts on the ground there. Um, so the town really does have a role to go in there and try and uh, uh, fix what kind of got broken as part of all the other fixes that happened. The, the curbs and the sidewalk had a lot of, uh, uh, certainly a, a ton of benefit and was um, the, the neighborhood was really looking for that. So. Um, so the, the degree of specificity of the recommendation that um, we were asked to make by uh, residents, that strikes me as beyond what we need to ask from DPW. I think that this is, you know, there are lots of standards here and everything. I don't want to put us in a position of seeming to be experts about anything um, that we're not experts on. And, um, <laughs> anything. Right, anything, nothing. Thing. We don't know anything. <laughs> um, that's why you pay us the big bucks. Um, <laughs> So to leave this at the discretion of Public Works to work this out with the public safety folks and the neighbors and whomever to make this rational, is that kind of a good enough recommendation? I, I mean, I think it's important that the select board say, yes, help these folks to improve the, the, the safety and practicality of parking on their street, but that we don't necessarily need to micromanage how they do that. Thoughts on that, Mr. Hayden? Yeah, just, just I'd, I'd like to recall the last time the select board did uh, road design and how well that went. Um, I, no, I, I agree. It's, it's a, I know it's not a problem that the, uh, the Public Works Committee has been working on for uh, more than a year now, so it would be nice to see it come to a conclusion. Okay, other thoughts about that part of the recommendation? Um, the thing about the extra permits for Hope Church, that isn't something that we've dealt with. It. How, what is this permit situation for town center? Parking. Um, there's day passes that are available to permit holders up to a certain amount, but that can be handled at an administrative level, and Claire deals regularly with town center permit holders in that situation. Ms. Begin. Um, so if the street became uh, <coughs> permit parking on the southern side, every resident would qualify for a permit. They're $25 each. Uh, Hope Church, being a resident, would qualify for um, pretty much as many as they asked for as long as it didn't become prohibitive in some way to the rest of the street. 
for so the other example that lends itself obviously is Grace, Grace Church next door is much closer to town center and is a much bigger organization and um, the permit system works perfectly with them. They have two or three employees who actually pull the permit um, and park in town center permit areas and the rest of their um, activities mostly happen on weekends when no permit is required. Okay, thank you. All right, other questions or comments then about the town center permit stuff? Boltwood Garage Reserve parking. Concerns? Parking lot permit parking. Innovative new program. All right, then I think that we are looking to support all of these things except to table the minimum charge part of it until we have further data. Um, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion as appropriate? Sure, you want it all read. <laughs> I, I only ask because it is a page and I'm happy to do it, but uh, I didn't know, I can do this. Well, we could also, <laughs> you do have plenty of practice even tonight. Yes, you could I'm, say, I'm getting quite as in the described, groove. as noted on the, on the motion sheet, if we wanted to do that. All right. Why don't, don't, read read through it in, in why, don't, why don't I try shorthand for this? I move okay. that the select board approve the proposed changes to the parking regulations as follows. Um, and as noted in the handout, for the commercial um, loading zones, for the 15-minute parking spaces, for the tacky taxing stands, for the town center permit parking, for Boltwood Garage reserve parking, for the parking lot permit parking, and the minimum charge for um, debit or credit cards be tabled to a, f a future meeting. Second. Perfect. Nice. Thank you for the discussion. Um, I'll just note that um, that the that the select board's sense on the town center permit will be noted in the minutes, and that we are we are supporting Thank the idea you. of finding good, safe um, parking situation for those folks. Further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you. Um, thank you all for the, the effort that went into this stuff. Um, and thank you to the town manager and the bid and everyone for coordinating to come up with this stuff. You know, the, you turn a dial and it turns a whole bunch of other things. And so we understand the complication of this. Um, so, um, all right. So, I apologize that we're later on everything than we expected to be. But now we are up to food truck regulations. Um, Last week, I presented to the select board the draft, uh, the draft details, not the regulations themselves, but the details to be turned into language um, of food truck regulations as Mr. Krograbe and Mr. Marulis of the chamber and I had uh, worked on. Since that time, we have distributed them to licensees. We have uh, distributed them to town staff. Is that right, Mr. Musanti? Um, and we are soliciting comment from folks. So first of all, I wanted to check in with Select Board on your comments, uh, any thoughts that you've had over the week. I will note that we had one bit of comment that came in, public comment, uh, through email, and that uh, is in your packet and is on our web packet. We also have a letter to us, uh, more comment um, from one of the licensees on our desk this evening. And uh, so first, comment from Select Board, and then I'll open it up to the audience. Mr. Hayden? Well, I'm wondering if, if um, we missed one parking regulation, which is one that would tell you, tell us where we might allow these trucks to, to park generally. Uh, besides that, and in light of the comment that we had, um, I just I want to note that it has been, um, been observed in, in a number of, of um, hearings we've had a little while ago um, so the, uh, the fact that these things do provide a service that people do want, so it's not a matter of getting rid of them without getting rid of that service. Thank you. So it's good to do this. Yeah, and it's, and it's good to kind of get ahead of it before it turns into, you know, a uh, hundred applications suddenly that we don't know what to do with. Ms. Brewer. Um, following up on that, it, actually just the same thing I said last week, which is that as, and I'm assuming as staff, vets them, they will find places to plug themselves in as to who enforces what. So it's just super clear to people. You know, if I have a problem with X, 
this is going to go over here, and this is who I should call. If, I, if I'm concerned that about this happening or meters or whatever, and just lays these various pieces out that we've been just trying to deal with as we move along, I, and whether or not you bag spaces or et cetera. So I just think that just having everything written down in one place right. that we can look at will just simplify a lot of things. All right. So we are getting feedback from staff on that. Um, I gave a, a sort of a soft deadline of the 11th for that feedback to, to see. Um, well, the goal is to get these in place as quickly as possible, but not to short circuit the process. So if, if it turns out that it needs longer time, um, then, then this will take as long as it needs. Um, if if we get all the comment we might get by the 11th, then the goal would be to turn these into language potentially for the 18th, or if I can't manage it for the 18th, then it would be for that's the first meeting in April. So, um, but th so that's our general time frame. So, any other comments, concerns from Select Board before I open it up to the public, Mr. Eden? Yeah, I would just just say that um, given that we don't have a lot of experience with these this type of um, vending, food vending. In this spot, I mean, they happen all over the world, of course, but other places in the world are not Amherst, and ha we have different uh, requirements and different, you know, uh, properties. Um, so I'm going to bet that we don't get it exactly right the first time, but that's okay. Continue to tweak them, just like we do the rest of our parking stuff. Okay, thank you. All right, folks from the audience would like to comment. Yes, sir. Please come forward and identify yourself. Hello, um, my name is Martin Carrera, and uh, I'm uh, I have a business here in downtown Amherst called La Vera Cruzana, and we've been here since uh, 1998. And I'm not here tonight to oppose food trucks because maybe one of these days I may want to have one here in town. So, but what I am here for is that I feel that currently the process is not a fair process. When I look at how long it took me to open up my restaurant here in Amherst, which was from the day that I first leased it and started paying monthly rent, I think it was a three month process in where I had to go to the planning board, zoning board, design and review board. And that was three months in order to get my permit to build out, okay? So then it took me another two months to do the build out, which is five months. With these food trucks, I think that we are not asking sufficient questions of how they should operate as the questions that we ask restaurant owners. You know, every year I get inspected by the building inspector, I get inspected by the fire inspector and I get inspected two, two times a year by the health inspector. Um, I think that it's, it's more than just the recommendations that, uh, that Tony and, and Alex made and, and, that, and that the select board has worked on. I think that it, this is requires, you know, like I said in my email uh, last week, that we set up a committee to come up with regulations that are pertinent to this type of industry so that we don't create something that later on we may feel that we need to, that, that is out of hand such as let's take into consideration um, it, I looked at the regulations in Austin Texas and one of the things that they had stipulated that if a food truck is more than two hours in one spot they're required to enter into an agreement with a business, a brick and mortar business, uh, so that they can use their bathrooms, so that the employees of that food truck can use their bathrooms. Do we right now have a, such a regulation for the food trucks? Do we know where their employees are using their bathroom? You know, um, that's important. The other thing is, um, I don't own property in Amherst, but through my, through my rental charge, my, my, my landlord pays his property taxes. And that, that's, that's what restaurant owners here in the downtown area do. You know, we, pay, we help our landlords pay those property taxes. And by us allowing in the community for food trucks to use 
public parking spaces, we are taking those public parking spots that are in very good shortage that are for people to shop in downtown in order we're using, we're allowing it to s somewhat subsidize a business and i just don't feel that's right i think i think that there are sufficient private lots that food trucks or 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 food stands can enter into agreement with private owners in order so that they can do their business and like i say as a restaurant owner, I'm not opposed to this form of business, but I also feel that the process needs to be just as rigorous as the process is to open up a restaurant. You know, they need to go before the planning, the zoning, and the design and review board, and they need the yearly inspections that are required. You know, maybe not at the cost that is the the, the 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 regular restaurants do but they need you know who's going to check to make sure that that food truck is it has their fire extinguishers and their ansel system every year uh done you know is that is is that a regulation currently in place so they are, just so you know, they are, uh, they do have to hold the health department permit and they are res required to um, meet all of their inspection standards also. I don't actually know about the fire part of it, but, um, and they also have to um, make arrangements for a, a list of bathroom facilities that they can use. That's part of the health permit also. So. From a, health, a bathroom within a, do they have to have the agreement with the owner of that building? They have to submit something that, I, I don't know whose <laughs> agreement it's with, but they have to submit the, the list of bathrooms that they're allowed yes, to use. Yes, but if they say, well, I use the bathroom at, let's just take, for instance, my business. Well, I use the bathroom at La Vera Cruzana. Well, yeah, I don't disavow people from using the bathroom if they come in and uh, ask for the bathroom. But that doesn't mean that I should, that, 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 and I don't say, hey, are you operating a food truck? Right. You know, no. But as a business, you know, they should be required to enter into formal agreements for that bathroom. Okay, I, I had thought that was the case, but if it's not, um, then you know, we, I, we can look into that And, for and sure. so what I'm saying today, and what I'm asking the select board to do, is to set up somewhat of a committee so that we can write regulations into this new industry that is good for Amherst, good for the industry, so that we don't have this sense of division in where, you know, restaurant. I mean, when you look at, you know, I can take you several examples. Um, Camelito, uh, Comalitos in, 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 uh, in, uh, in South Amherst, um, the little burger joint that was gonna open where, um, in uh, in Michelson's gallery and the restaurant that's going to open next to it, they're all they all had to take a lot of time to open, based on having to go through rigorous by the building inspector and things like this. So, what is good for restaurant uh, businesses should be also good for food trucks. But we need to set up this committee in order so that we answer a lot of questions that are pertinent. We can't go piece by piece every year or every six months. You know, I think that it's time, because we've already allowed it, that's great. But let's set up a committee so that a lot of questions are answered. I don't think that that's unfair. Okay, thank you very much for your comments, appreciate it. Other folks about food trucks? Programme. Alex Kagrabe, Business Improvement District. Um, I, again, as I did last week, I want to uh, voice my support for the, the process that led to these regulation uh, proposals. Um, and also, um, I just wanted to talk about some principles that I think we should look at when we're thinking about this in general. First of all is safety. Um, and certainly 
the health department is looking at that closely for both restaurants and food trucks, both brick and mortars and mobile food food trucks. Um, and we just want to keep that in mind as a paramount concern in, in all cases. But I think we've got that under control mostly already. Um, the second thing is consistency. I think that food businesses should generally be going through the same process, whether they're brick and mortar or, or mobile. Um, and the third thing is efficiency. So Mr. Carrera was talking about the difference in um, process that it is to set up a, a food truck versus a brick and mortar restaurant. And I think it's, um, we need to address the, how efficient it is to open any sort of business in this town. Um, certainly there are processes that everyone expects to go through, but um, you know, if, if there's a difference in how long it takes to open a brick and mortar restaurant and between, and between that and how long it takes to open a food truck, um, the problem I see there is not that it it's too easy to open a food truck, the problem is there that it's too hard to open a brick and mortar. Um, so beyond that, I think um, I just want to reiterate something I said last week and something that Ms. O'Keefe has voiced, that we've all received a lot of comments on this issue in general, um, both supporting the vibrancy and excitement and innovation that food trucks bring and respecting the in investment that brick and mortars um, uh, give to the town and the permanence they offer. Um, so I think the important thing is is to have a balance. And I think that the proposal that is before you strikes a pretty good balance. So that's all. Thank you very much. Samantha. Hello. I'm Paris Valley. I'm one of the food truck owners, Paris and Ties. And uh, I went over the notes. The only concern I have really is my generator that has been complaining that it's loud. Yes, uh, when I started the truck here, yeah, my generator broke and I was trying to get a quiet one. But with the storms, I couldn't get a hold of one. So I invest a lot of money into a new one, which I include you a piece of paper with. Thank you. And uh, that's my big concern. You know, in the parking regulation, it's gonna have to work itself out. Yeah, we're looking yeah. for feedback from the parking uh, management and enforcement folks about how best to do that. Um, the recommendation uh, as currently stands is not to have a limit on it, but then how do we, how do we manage that? So, um, and I would like to add one thing to the comments about things maybe being licensed and being easy for us. I don't think so. I own a restaurant for 15 years. You know, I have the same standard as a restaurant would have. So I don't know where the information is coming from because I get inspection. Javeria goes to the truck. She already been there twice. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else on food trucks? Okay, Ms. Brewer. I know that um, on your list is bathrooms. I know we talked about that last time and parking and mm -hmm. how that's going to work. And I just want to make sure that I didn't lose sight of two things that I'd put in my notes. One was, had we, I can't tell from my notes, if we had thought that we wanted uh, town council's opinion as to whether or not we need to do anything associated with bylaws as opposed to just straightforward regulations. And the other being the hours on the license, which is something we've talked about associated with all the other kinds of licenses we do too. But maybe we could go ahead and address that now and it would apply to other things too. So when somebody tells us they're gonna be there from three to four, I mean, really, who's gonna ever go look at that? So why do they have to even say when they're gonna be there unless someone is planning to at some point go ask them to move? So um, I think we need to be clear on what the point of that is. If it's simply for the Board of Health, for example, for length of time to refrigerate things, you know, that's a different problem than just if you're open from 11 to 9 or 11 to 11, what does the select board care? But yet I don't want to have people putting things on their license that then somebody else says, well, actually they were there till 10, and it's not clear that there's any purpose to being concerned about those hours. What, what do those hours represent and who follows up on that? is something that's been true for all our licenses. Okay, 
We can follow up on that maximum enforcement, what that means, okay. Other comments or questions about the regs as presented? Okay. Um, so so the, the next steps would be to continue to get comment, um, to continue to uh, try and flesh out the answers to some of these questions that we've uh, gotten, um, and to bring recommendations forward just as soon as I possibly can. My, my intent, unless I hear otherwise from the select board, is to continue on the route we're going, to not actually address a committee issue, as, as Mr. Guerrero uh, recommended to us now. Um, to go along with Mr. Hayden's earlier point, um, I think that this is something that we can continue to adapt to as necessary, and if a committee became more necessary down the road, then, then I could see doing that. Um, at, at this point, we still have a very small food truck population, and so I, I, don't, I don't personally want to create more infrastructure than we need as part of this process, but if the select board is looking for something different, then you should let me know that now. Okay, Mr. Hayden. Yeah, maybe just, just, um, and this, this is, this is still the thinking out loud stage for me. Certainly, maybe there, there is one piece of infrastructure that uh, the suggestion of a committee puts into my mind, um, and the idea that there is a value to these things. Um, I'm wondering if, if we oughtn't have a, um, a mission statement or a preamble, a description of what the object of even considering to allow these things at all would be um, something um, to, to um, you know guide us. I mean, what are the, what are the ideas? The ideas are that that yes, this is this is it helps our town in some way, and it'd be nice to describe what that way is, or be clear about what we think or somebody thinks that those ways are, and it would be nice if um, they supported sort of the rest of the mission of our downtown, which is, you know, support the bricks and mortar as well as, you know, getting a multitudinous of services for our rather eclectic uh, clientele. Um, there's a revenue piece, there's this, the health and safety and sanitation piece and all that sort of stuff. Um, we don't have any of those ideas, you know, gelled or pulled together at all. We have a sense that it's a good idea. We have a sense that we need to regulate them traffic-wise. We have a sense that we need to be fair to the people who have invested lots of money in the bricks and mortar downtown. We have a sense that um, people should be safe using it. You know, but no words. Okay, I can give that a shot. So. Oh, thank you. Um, I was going to say, it sounds like you want to write a mission statement <laughs> oh, no, to I'll give to her. <laughs> and if you don't get it done, oh, wow. Well. Oh, well. So I, I think that, I, so I can appreciate the point that, um, that it, we can frame this a bit. Um, so yeah. so I, I can try to frame it and, and see what you think of that. Um, so the alternative is why we're not um, preventing them, prohibiting them. So if, if you're looking for something like that, that's probably not the track I would go on. But if you wanted to engage no. in the thought exercise of why we're not prohibiting them and, and if that would... Um, yeah, hyperbole you know, helps me think through things, that's all. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it's an interesting point. I mean, people do raise certainly interesting points about the property taxes and about the, the process, et cetera. Um, and so I think that Mr. Uh, Maroulis and Mr. Krograbi and I were, were starting from, or at least got to the point of, you know what, actually this is a good thing, mm -hmm. and it's about striking that balance, um, because it does add a, a different kind of, of a vibrancy and, and change to the downtown that, that at this point we're thinking is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, there are, you know, there are there are other ways to look at this for sure, and that could become persuasive either now if one wanted to try and persuade that way or in the future. Um, but I think we're currently working at from a place of, okay, we think this is good and we want to make sure that it works as well as possible for as many people as possible considering all the different interests. Yeah. And how can we tell that it is working and what well is? Yeah. yeah. Um, one thing I, I think um, that I, I would like to look into is the permit fee for this. Um, you know, typically our, our fee, or not typically, I think the legal thing is that you can't, your fees can't be a profit center. You basically can't charge more than what it takes to administer um, 
the 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 whatever it is that you're you're doing a fee for. Um, but I think that w what we're talking about, particularly with the enforcement issues and everything, I believe the fee is currently a hundred dollars for a for a food truck license, and I think that that might not actually adequately reflect the fees that are involved in trying to manage this from a parking perspective. From well, the health fee is different. I'm not sure, but uh, if if the select board is it wouldn't mind my looking into that. That is something I could explore with um, with town staff and town council as well, Ms. Brewer. I was just going to um, add the add the little side note to that that. One of the things that's so fascinating about these fees is beyond the fact that they can't be a profit center, there's often a place in Mass General Law where it says, and it won't be any more than X. Right. So even if it turns out that in everyone's reality it costs more than that to administer it, there's some ancient law still on the books. So there might be a limit already on those, but I know that we've we've talked in general terms about maybe doing that with liquor licenses, uh, the one-day liquor licenses, et cetera, too. But we're always looking to maximize, but not prevent. And yeah, that would definitely be worth knowing. Are we limited to 100, or is there a calculation that can be made? Right, and so that's an excellent point. I'll check that part first <laughs> before I go through the other homework of it instead of finding, finding that out it. at the end. <laughs> OK, anything else to say on food trucks right now? This is going to be so easy. So easy, yes. Thanks, everyone, for your comments. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for submitting written comment. Really appreciate it. And. Uh, and we'll just keep giving feedback as this process goes along because you know it, it's it is a dynamic situation and and we really do want it to work for everyone. So, Ms. and I'm sorry to belabor this, but I just want to try and make it clear to people that you know we kind of already do have a committee, and that committee has been you and Alex and Tony working on this. We've talked about it. Town staff's working on. It. So, and and hopefully everyone's hearing everyone else's feedback from out in the community as well. And that this will be po you know posted on our website just like it normally is when we are ready to look at it. It's not like we're gonna sit here and craft it one night, you know, on the fly and then say that's good enough. I mean, it's that it's continuing to go through these iterations and it will be, po people can go look at it before we come here, even though it's not the same thing as a public hearing as we have about other things. Right, right, there's a good chance it wouldn't be ready much before the meeting, especially that's, if it were the 18th. Right, so that doesn't mean we have to decide at that meeting either. Exactly, that that's matter. exactly right, and, and I think I said this at the beginning, but it's worth reiterating. <coughs> um, this this will take as long as it needs to take. That's, we don't right. want it to take longer than that, but uh, but um, you know, if whenever it's brought forward for, um, for recommendation, if it isn't ready yet, then it will take longer. Right. So. Okay. But that will give people another opportunity to say, Absolutely. oh, that's what you meant. Oh, you actually covered these five things, but you forgot this one thing. Right. So that'd be good. Thank you. Okay. Moving on from food trucks then. Oh, uh, let's see. Where are we? I should never leave the house and say, yeah, it doesn't look like a very long meeting today. <laughs> it's the last thing out the door. Okay. So uh, now it is oh, so getting towards 9. Uh, oh, oh, let's wait another oh, five okay, minutes yeah. and call it an okay. hour. <laughs> We're an hour behind. Uh, budget discussion, town and state. Ms. Brewer submitted to us. That Why, she did. I was just thinking this would be a perfect place to slot this in. Yeah. Well, you have talked before, so you led us to this point. You have talked before about whether or not we might um, be in the position of, as we have frequently done in the past with this particular select board, uh, written letters of support to our, to, of course, our very supportive representative and senator, but also being very specific about the things that Amherst will find beneficial and that we think are beneficial to the Commonwealth. So when I saw this, I was so excited to see that the governor is using technology, yay! And they came up with these interesting maps that they presented, which obviously you need a magnifying glass for if you're going to look at them in this size. But it's an interesting approach to transportation and education. And then they made these for each of the representatives and senators and made a big deal out of this so that everybody can go and say to their representative or senator, hey, this is what we're talking about. This is why actually this is a pretty good plan because it would advantage all these things in terms of education. So I wanted you to see that this was out there because this is a new thing that they haven't done before. And it's, yeah. it's something, you know, we are very fortunate, as we always say here, that Stan and Ellen know what we like, know what we want, but it doesn't hurt to reinforce it now and again. And it's also really interesting that now other communities can now do this. Perhaps, you know, they're not always as receptive to some of these arguments. And now this information's been delivered to each of those representatives and senators already, and so now they're just encouraging their constituents to go and talk to them about it. So I didn't know if we're at the point where we felt like it was time to write something, because obviously you've got like a thousand other things you're writing right now, 
but were we to do so, this could be another piece of supporting documentation for that. Absolutely. Thank you very much for um, for submitting these. So uh, when you submitted them, that was the first that I had learned that the governor had actually put these out per map per district, which is brilliant. So this is so um, people completely understand this. This is the governor's um, plan for new tax revenue and um, where it would go to. And so uh, three of us, uh, plus Mr. Marie-Santi, were at the, the governor visited Amherst the other day to do an interview on Amherst Media, which I recommend everyone watch, um, to talk about his budget plan. And he really stressed this idea of regional equity. The state, the, the citizens of Massachusetts have really been burned too many times on the idea that, oh yes, it's gonna pay for stuff everywhere when in fact it all just goes into the giant black hole of the big dig or, or for whatever other other reason doesn't make it, you know, east of 495 or whatever. Um, so this is this is saying in very clear terms. Okay, here are what the benefits would be to each of the districts uh, for the representatives and the senators. And it's worth looking beyond just our district to, to look at the region, especially from a transportation mm -hmm. perspective. We all know that transportation isn't just about the, you know the roads and the infrastructure in your your personal town, but it's the uh, it's the the roads and infrastructure and the places that you travel to. So this is the governor really kind of making a very detailed promise to the whole state of what the benefits would be from both the education and the transportation elements of the budget. Um, he said that, the governor said that um, it's really critical, the reason they're putting this information out there is A, to educate, but B, to inspire people to call their representatives and senators to let them know that this is important to them. As we know, uh, the idea of tax increase is really kind of anathema to elected folks, so they're not going to do it on their own. They're going to only do it if they hear from folks saying, no, this is really important to us, we appreciate what the money would go for and that is worthwhile. Um, the House is going to be making its decisions really mid-March. Mid-March is the critical time for them. Um, so this is when that advocacy needs to happen. And that, when we were in this meeting the other day, I was like, whoa, mid-March, okay, that's like a week and a half. And right. <laughs> time just passes very quickly. So yes, this is the time. This is the time for us to put out a letter to, um, to Stan and to Ellen, to the chairs of the House Ways and Means, Senate Ways and Means, to uh, MMA, so that they know. And also to get it into the paper. You know, if this is, this is, the select board is recommending that this is important to Amherst and that um, the, the citizens of Amherst should support this. If they support this, they should let those folks know also. Ms. Stein. And it's important also to send it to Teresa Murray, yes, Chair of the you. Senate, and to DeLeo. Um, right. The, the key opinion leaders and decision right. makers on Beacon Health. And, and the governor, the governor and our reps would, uh, yep. our rep would support our doing so because she has, uh, Ellen's story has been for a tax increase for a long time and this is a really rather progressive way of increasing revenue via taxation. So I'm totally for sending those letters. So uh, Mr. Musanti has agreed to help me with uh, communication points, key communication yep. points about these Excellent. details. Um, Wonderful. This all will happen before the next select board meeting. Yep. Would folks mind if it this just happens? Yep. You know, trust we me to write a it. good enough letter and get it circulated. Okay. Can I just Mr. make Musanti. two other points, and it's in particular about the transportation piece. And I agree the governor's uh, district by district map puts some dollars be next to the uh, solution, you know, looking at Amherst, we have a $16 million road backlog of, of needs. Uh, it was 21 million. We've borrowed four and a half million dollars from property tax, which is a finite source of, of revenue. Uh, but we still have 16 million to go. The governor's proposal would provide $12 million to the town of Amherst uh, over the next 10 years. And this would be in the form of a 10 year uh, commitment that we would know that in calendar 2013 that we have a certain amount of money coming to us and that like any business out there or any family it allows you to plan and we would uh, with that sort of commitment uh, we would be able to put together uh, one or more uh, bond issues uh, to be paid back 
with those funds, or at least a, a large portion of those funds, to allow us to do these roads sooner rather than later? Because I don't think there's any disagreement uh, that we have major road needs. Pick, pick your street, Triangle Street, Northeast Street, Pine Street, uh, portions of East Pleasant Street, uh, any number of, of side street, residential streets that haven't been touched in 20 or more years. Uh, so there's a very long list, we have it, that can be part of our documentation. And it's not just the dollars, but it's the multi-year commitment that would allow us to do it at less cost today, uh, particularly if we're going to bond this stuff at less than 2% over a 10-year period like we did on tonight's bond issue. Uh, now is the time for action on the part of uh, our our friends in the legislature. And uh, uh, the second piece of this is related to regional transit uh, to, to end this never-ending cycle of service cuts and fare increases. Uh, the governor has put together a bold proposal to fund regional transit, including the PVTA, which serves over a million and a half riders every year in Amherst. Uh, there would be substantially more stable funding uh, beginning this year that allows us to preserve service, keep fares reasonable, and in a very selective way look at expanding service where appropriate. And I'll fight for our fair share for Amherst on that uh, in my role at the PVTA. But we can't do that without dollars, and that's part of the whole conversation that the governor and legislators are trying to have right now. Thank you. All right, so uh, we will get this out ASAP. And Thank uh, you for doing that. Thank you to both okay. of you. Good. Thanks. Brandon Anything else on uh, budget discussion, Honor State? No. All right. Then moving right along, Ms. Stein. I'm just wondering if we could. I don't know why this gentleman is here, but I wondered if he was for the East Park Media um, Preservation request. No, this is the same gentleman who was here for no, Gaylord. Killing time. Just, <laughs> now he's just enjoying. Well, I can't imagine anything better to do <laughs> on a Monday <laughs> night either, but. <laughs> Okay. Too many cars parked well, on Gaylord World. <laughs> Thank you for noticing that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're trapped. Okay, so town manager's report. Uh, sure. Uh, first, Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Working Group Update. Uh, the work group is, uh, I believe, and, and hope uh, in the home stretch. Uh, there is a, another in a series of weekly meetings uh, tomorrow, March 5th, uh, in the afternoon, at which the work group will discuss in more detail specific possibilities and options on penalties and violations. Uh, they'll get an opportunity for dialogue with town council on all the kind of legal questions related to rental regulations. And they'll review uh, another updated draft set of regulations that I uh, uh, believe uh, and it's been a laborious process, I believe, is directly uh, responsive to uh, the objectives that have been identified as the key priorities th for things to include and not include uh, in uh, improved uh, rental regulations. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, there'll be the second public forum from 7 to 9 p.m. in this room, uh, where there'll be a review of of draft regulations and another opportunity for the public to uh, uh, make comments. And I think they're still very much in the home stretch looking to complete a set of recommendations to me ideally next week. Uh, but we'll see how it goes tomorrow. Another important meeting. I'll be there. Thank you. Questions or comments about safe and healthy? All right. Uh, next, I uh, want to talk about uh, uh, not St. Patrick's Day, but an event uh, that is held uh, the weekend before St. Patrick's Day, um, and some work I've been doing with uh, uh, downtown uh, bar owners, uh, a handful of them, uh, and police chief and uh, uh, Stephanie's been able to join us for a couple of those discussions. And the goal is to uh, allow these businesses to continue to operate uh, and, uh, you know, make a living, but not have unintended consequences of having uh, extraordinarily large congregations of patrons uh, uh, outside and uh, 
doing inappropriate things outside. Uh, so we've we've met with uh, the owners of McMurphy's and uh, uh, Stackers, uh, uh, and and uh, urge them. And to their great credit, they've been attempting to be very responsive to this and coming up with a. Uh, they'll be open for business uh, regular hours on Saturday, March 9th, but. Uh, uh, in a way to uh, not encourage uh, uh, excessive numbers from uh, 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 waiting to get in outside, basically doing a, 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 a ticketing process uh, that within the limits of their occupancy uh, limits uh, for the early parts of the day, uh, beginning at 11 a.m. With, with a couple of, of ticketed entries uh, between 11 a.m. Uh, up until 3 p.m. Uh, we'll also have additional uh, police uh, presence in the downtown to try to uh, have that day occur so that all those who want to uh, uh, be in the downtown and do business in the downtown can can do their thing and, and get the most out of it. Thank you. And I'll just add to that that... Um uh, it, emphasizing the point of how cooperative uh, the folks from McMurphy's and Stackers have been on this. We met with them last year after the event to say, okay, this was kind of a mess. What do we do to make it better? And we met with them a couple of weeks ago to say, okay, all the stuff we talked about before, you know, are we ready? How's this going to work? Um, so they have really been terrific partners. They're doing great messaging about this. They've got great big signs outside uh, on their windows right now talking about the whole plan for that day, which is next Saturday, March 9th. They're also doing uh, all of the messaging about it on their Facebook pages, so um, people are aware. Um, and I want to emphasize that this is, I believe this is the 14th year of this uh, occasion uh, as it's been being celebrated. Um, this only kind of grew into a problem in the last couple of years. For many years, this just kind of went on and nobody even paid any attention to it. Um, part of that is uh, the social media just kind of increases everything exponentially and part of it is just kind of the culture has changed and so um, what I really want to emphasize is that this is no longer just a bar event this is really kind of a collegiate event that is marked all over the country um, the problem does not start or end with people um, marking the occasion at the bars so it, it's important to not place blame inappropriately to this. Um, we could, you know, there, there are all kinds of articles out there about what has happened in other places. Um, Pennsylvania, State College Pennsylvania has a, a big uh, marking of this occasion. They do theirs this year, at least they did it in February. They call it State Patrick's Day, and they actually paid all of the retail uh, establishments anybody with a liquor license, whether it was a package store, a restaurant, or a bar, to not sell alcohol on that day. It cost them almost $200,000. And that reduced their arrests by a third, which sounds good, but they still had a couple hundred arrests. So this is, so uh, what my point is, you don't need the, you don't need the liquor outlets on that day for this to be an occasion. So I just want to kind of have people keep this in perspective. Um, I believe the university is going to be messaging to the students about expectations for this. Um, I think that the, uh, the, um, new strictures that we've put in place are definitely going to help, especially in the downtown. Um, then there are other factors that we just don't know, like weather. You know, if it's a beautiful spring day, then there are going to be a lot more people wanting to participate in this, and there are going to be a lot more regular families downtown doing, going about their business. Um, whereas if it's cold and drizzly, that much more of all of us will stay home. So it, it's very hard to know. Um, but, uh, but we are, we are, we and the businesses take the community concerns very seriously about this, and we are trying to uh, get this back under control and into something that everyone can enjoy um, safely. So, Ms. Brewer. Appreciating all of that positive messaging, and, and really, because I know you're approaching it through a bunch of different directions, and really some of the, the mail that we get about this sort of thing, one of which I didn't even open today, um, is kind of the same thing we're hearing associated with safe and healthy neighborhoods. We're working on it, we're working on it, you know, give us a little time, we're working on this, oh yeah, whatever. And people are just out to criticize. And so we'll see how this year goes. I think that it is important for people in the community to also understand that in addition to all this positive messaging, were things to be the same as last year, 
or worse. I, there's every possibility that we would consider not selling alcohol that day or insisting that private security be hired. Or I mean, there are other draconian things that can be done, which are have limited success perhaps other places. We are not just saying, this will be, I'm sure it'll work out better this year. It's that you're having these conversations, we're assuming things are gonna be a little better, there's only so much control we have, but there are other measures we could consider in future, but they don't seem to be appropriate right now. I think that's an important thing for people to understand because you know, it's one thing to say, well, we'll have extra police there. Well, why should our police be there if it's just people lining up outside the bar 50 deep and people can't get by them on the sidewalk? Why is that our problem? So you know, in terms of dealing with that level of resentment and that kind of criticism, I think it's just, I, I think we're saying we continue to have this conversation. And we didn't need to have it until a couple of years ago, like you pointed out. Life is changing on so many levels, and we are certainly hoping that everything will go better this year. And if it doesn't, then we'll continue to have the conversation, and maybe there will be some other things. But rather than saying, oh, well, the obvious solution to do X is to just do this draconian thing, I think it, it's smart that we're not doing that, but that we have those options still theoretically available to us in future. Right. So I, I think the most important point is that we continue to monitor it and see exactly. how it goes. Um, you know, draconian is actually way more complicated than you might think I'm right sure. off the top of your head. So um, I'm sure. So whether whether we would go down that road. And, and so that's partially what I was saying about, you know, this isn't just about the bars and restaurants. So um, the question of who you hold responsible yes. for what kind of behavior when the people aren't even in the establishment, they've never even been in there. Um, this is now kind of a this is a pseudo a pseudo event, a pseudo holiday that has its own infrastructure around it so um so a life of its own we'll, we'll see what dials we could continue to turn if necessary but um but hopefully with all of the messaging with the steps that have been taken this will be in a better place the other thing i want to emphasize is because this is um a point of confusion every year uh no bars or restaurants will open early on that day everyone will only open at their licensed time they could they would be in violation of their liquor license if they opened early um, no one has requested to open early if they did I'm sure we would not approve it considering That's the circumstances point, huh? um, the police chief uh, and uh, the officers go around and speak to all of the establishments leading up to this just to remind everyone you're absolutely not opening early or you're being shut down. Um, there's a great deal of communication and coordination that happens uh, for this event. Um, they did not open early last year. I mean, there's just no, so the, part of the idea is that the uh, people lining up outside makes people think that it's open, but it's not. Right. Um, so just because people are lined up doesn't mean that they are open. Um, at the same time, part of the messaging from Stackers and McMurphys is don't even bother getting in line if you don't have a ticket, and if you it's do really have a Ticket, then you can't get in line before half an hour early. But they are it, it, being ticket based. They are only selling up to capacity for an 11 o'clock opening, and then later for a one o'clock opening. If there is capacity, you know, people leave between 11 and one. Too bad. Nobody's going in again until the next bunch of tickets start at one o'clock. So, um, so it, it, it a lot of thought has been given to this, and uh, you know, it, it, this won't be perfection. It won't be some silver bullet, but uh, but it should be progress, and it certainly has right. been great cooperation. So that's great to hear. All right, moving on. Great. Uh, without belaboring our talk about the transportation thing, uh, preview of 2013 paving plan. Just note uh, next meeting on March 18th. Uh, I'll be presenting along with DPW staff specific recommendations for the 2013 uh, paving season. Uh, this Thursday night, the 7th, uh, the Public Works Committee is meeting in this room at Town Hall, uh, 7 to 9 p.m. A uh, portion of the meeting will be a, a, a second uh, preliminary design hearing related to Pine Street improvements. We encourage people to uh, learn more online and ideally come come to that hearing. Uh, that is a multi-million dollar project. Uh, we are attempting uh, repeatedly to secure state grants for a portion of the work, but the, a, a more detailed design uh, is a concurrent process and we want people's input on that. Um, and I'll be meeting with the Public Works Committee later that night to review the <coughs> various lists for uh, residential streets as well as some of the more major heavily traveled streets and what makes the most sense given our limited dollars. 
to recommend uh, for the current year. So we'll have some details on that at, at your next meeting. Uh, next, uh, you had asked uh, at your last meeting, we were talking about parking system related issues, one of which is signage, uh, which there will be signs going up next to the multi-space machines uh, sometime in early April. Uh, you're interested in the uh, uh, draft text, uh, and in your packet is some draft text, including beautiful colors. Uh, um, and so it's meant to be uh, a kind of a step-by-step, -step, uh, eye-level, easy-to-read sign. Uh, so either now or by email or follow-up, <laughs> any and all feedback is more than welcome. We haven't made them yet. That's done. Is it possible for us to get the template? This is a good beginning, but there are changes I would like to play around with. Um, I can also just send an email, but it would be lovely if I can fool with the absolute template. Uh, I suspect we can send something to you, to the board right. electronically. Thanks. It's a good beginning, but I think we could make it better. Other questions okay. or comments? Uh, Mr. Hayden, Mr. Hayden, Hayden I hope. Yeah. Yeah, just, just uh, I, like I say, I've only used one of these things once and not very well. Um, you really don't press OK after you put your coin in and get your hours? That's just a random thing. It says OK, you know. Unfortunately, no, that doesn't work. Um, and that, <laughs> that's actually, I'm pretty sure pressing OK at the end doesn't work. And that, that to me is one of the big problems. And, and I'm not sure if the slowness of the system, once that's dealt with, that will be um, kind of dealt with. But I don't think so. I think there is a lack of closure when you're using it. So you put in your, okay. you put in your, your coins, and then it says, OK, you know, an hour and, and uh, you know, an hour. And then it starts ticking down. And there's a guy behind you. But like you don't want to step away because if he comes up to the machine and he's going to press, who knows what's going to happen? Is, is that going to like make your time go away? Right. Is he going to add to your time? But if you press I for information at the end, then that actually kind of zeroes out your your thing and lets you start over. I don't think OK works. OK, no, OK doesn't work because OK takes you to the credit card options. After you put your coins in there. Yes, it automatically brings up the credit card options, which is frustrating. Um, <laughs> so so I'm thinking that adding a line about I. Uh, to sort of, but you don't want to go to zero. You want to say I'm done. To sort That's of close it. out exactly. It's like yes, I've That's put it. in. Thank right. you. It Thank keeps, you. It keeps waiting for you to put in more coins, and then it takes a while. Or credit card. Uh, I, no, I don't. I don't know I, how the credit card works. I actually went through <laughs> both of these today because I, I was curious. And you're right. It shows you 29, and you're thinking 29 what? <laughs> um, and, and then suddenly it's gone, and so you don't know what's happened. And then I did it with the credit card on a different machine just to see, um, and that was a little bit better, but it, and, and I did it with this in hand. So I was very hard, trying very hard to get this thing to work. It is not, not so clear as we would like it to be for visitors to our town. It's it's an it's amazing the degree of frustration I hear about yes. these things yeah. and um, and I don't know why I, I don't find it hard to use really I find that I find it have a little bit of annoyances here and there but I don't find it hard because you use, bike <laughs> I park way too often um, so uh, so okay so we have this and we'll we'll offer comment Ms. Can I throw on just a couple quick things one is of course we aren't going to do the two hour minute. we probably won't address that before you want to print the signs so. I don't know how that's going to work, but if we do, I think I, we should be considering looking at a two dollar. If, if say we'd part pass tonight's thing, I would rather it said two dollar minimum rather than two hour minimum, Me too. because there are going to be lots that two hours your maximum too. And so, and I grant you, when we change parking rates, we're going to have to fix the <coughs> sign, but the signs are going to be beat up by then anyway. So what I'm saying is, if it says card and debit, not debt card debit, which I know you're going to circle right now on your little um, sure. list there so that it doesn't say that. Um, it it so was an evening for debt. Worth, it must worth have been a considering. Thing. The other, I'm luckily haven't myself actually used a card. I would just ask that really these machines expect you to put your card in twice. That's ludicrous. Either this is wrong or I, that's I ludicrous. I think that's 
just the picture, and I think it's in the wrong place. That's, that's well, it's numbered. Yeah. Four and six. It's numbered. Know, oh, so six is really two. just supposed to be a picture. Exactly. That's oh, the well, way that I makes it. so much sense. Okay. <laughs> I want to play See, with that's this. That's why right. you did. So we'll go back and. And my I'm only other point. I'm spending a lot of money to test the system, but I will do it. Hey, you get you get 300 gross a year. Come on. I know. My only other comment is this, and I'm not sure. Just to think about amongst ourselves as to how we say this. I'm sure this came up when you bought the machine in the first place, because I know a bunch of different people tested it, et cetera, is the thing that I think people don't get, and it's not really reflected in the directions either. You enter your space number, look and see how much time is left. That's one of the things that confuses people, is that they don't know how that part of it works. And so if you look and you've got 29 minutes, well, your problem solved, potentially. So. I think because these aren't machines that you know sense magically when you drive away and start over from zero like some individual space machines are in more high-tech places, I think that it's important that part of the reason there's the confusion, there's the 3G thing associated with the credit card, but I think just in general, people are trying to throw coins in and not they're not taking the moment to say, I'm trying to find out how much money's on this machine, and then I need to add to it. And I think that's true for both cash and credit, because if there's already $2 on there, well, then you don't have to worry about it. Okay, all good comments. Send further feedback to Mr. Yeah. Nancy by email, and uh, we'll keep trying to get this right. Okay, next. Recent and upcoming, anything else? Uh, sure, a couple things. Uh, um, well, you mentioned the governor's visit, but um, this past weekend, uh, on Saturday, uh, two school-related events. In the morning, the Amherst uh, Regional School District Planning Committee Forum, the Amherst, the, or the RSD PC, as it's affectionately called by the committee members. Uh, we had the Amherst Forum at the uh, high school library. A number of us were there. And, you know, a modest, I guess, would be a diplomatic turnout uh, oh. way of describing the turnout of Amherst residents, but very informative uh, uh, hearing itself. And uh, I know the uh, study committee is planning to reconvene next Saturday the 9th and hopefully uh, forward some recommendations on whether and how to proceed uh, related to school regionalization. In the afternoon, uh, um, most, if not all of us, were at the four town meeting, looking which we meet periodically on the regional schools budget. Um, the long and short of it is uh, a superintendent gave a budget update. Uh, the four towns, in their own uh, way, uh, expressed uh, support for uh, the budget as proposed and their uh, willingness and ability to fund the uh, estimated assessments that accompany the budget. So that was positive, and it's only March. Yes, those are good meetings, yeah. good shape. Ms. Brewer, do you want to add anything to those now? Or I'll wait do it or later. Okay. When everybody's really tired. <laughs> uh, are there questions or comments from Mr. Musanti? All right, thank you very much. So then JCPC update. Okay. Um, this week, um, this past week, um, the fire department uh, came and made its requests. I was amazed to find a placeholder for $8 million for, uh, well, you have to admit, that's a large figure, <laughs> um, for the possibility of a fire station, should we be able to find land or should it be donated to us or somehow mirror uh, miraculously appear. Um, a highlight of the meeting uh, was getting a demonstration of a mechanical device that delivers CPR to um, people who have stopped breathing at the appropriate and approved rate of 100 compressions per minute. To see this working on one of the dummies that they also, mannequins, that they also plan to, to buy for training purposes, which will save the town money because they won't have to go to other municipalities for training. Um, but to see it uh, working <coughs> is amazing, and the whole JCPC got to see it. 
And it's a, astonishing, but you can clamp this device to the stretcher so that the compressions continue as the patient who is not breathing is being moved to the ambulance. And the third thing that they um, requested were defibrillators. And all of those three that I just mentioned, the, the compressions, um, the mannequins, and the defibrillators um, would be paid for out of the ambulance funds. And they're also asking for one staff vehicle and um, to replacement for protective gear, which tends to get worn out. Planning asked for $50,000 for GIS mapping uh, for floodplain analysis, which would be better information for building, um, which makes sense. Um, it's been delayed because we were getting better aerial measurements, but we hope to move forward and get this finished within a year. Conservation uh, would like $10,000 for new posts and fencing at Puffer's Farm. Um, they're very concerned about uh, people leaping off the dam and the fencing um, has, it's 20 years old, it's worn out, there's been pieces removed. The library uh, needs um, an upgrade to the fire system. Um, interestingly, the, um, the request has been reduced from about 100,000 from last year to about 30,000 this year because they work together with the fire department and I'm sure they're gonna get um, an adequate system but at a tremendous saving. They also are requesting $25,000 for roof repairs. And it really, considering that the Jones is almost the heart of the town in a way, to see the water buckets that are stationed all over the downstairs because it leaks around the atrium mm -hmm. and the staff has to go around after a good rainstorm and empty the buckets. So that's... Um, a very serious capital request. They also need 18,000 for basement insulation for the North Amherst Library because without this, there's no way to control the environment for the books, which is very bad for the collection. So um, those are the requests that came in this past week. Thank you very much. Mr. Wald, anything to add? Pretty um, <laughs> he was there faithfully. Is, is the um, is this floodplain mapping GIS thing? Have we either already approved this or or we didn't approve it in the past? This seems like it comes up all the time. It was on the capital budget last year. We discussed it, but didn't go forward for various reasons. Yeah. And some costs have gone up since then too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Other liaison reports. Ms. Stein. Um, Jim and I went together oh, yeah. to the flag company. And I am happy to report the colors have been chosen, the deposit paid, and the flags have been ordered. <laughs> we, should wow. have, we should have a uh, town flag <laughs> um, within a month. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. You've both done a great amount of work and coordination on this. Thank you for having to actually go down there. Well, to really I was very grateful off. to have um, Jim go along with me. It's better to have two heads making the decisions. And, um, and then CPAC also met on Thursday. And, uh, okay, um, I don't know where to start. It's, it's basically a very difficult year for CPAC. They have um, $607,000 roughly, of which 164,000 roughly is committed to pay for Plum Brook, uh, Plum Brook Town Hall, um, Am Amherst Housing Authority, and the Hawthorne property. Those are previous obligations. Um, that leaves 442,000, almost 443,000 to fund $881,000 worth of requests. So at a meeting where previously people have been able, the committee has been able to, to essentially make 
decisions. Um, they only made two, um, 2,000 for administration and 10,000 for open space surveys and almost everything else got deferred to an additional meeting which will be uh, two weeks uh, in two weeks on Thursday. Um, what a, to give you an idea of the difficulty, just for open space, um, there's enough projects. Well, I don't know if you call it all open space, but 150,000 for the Southeast Street Rock Farm property. The Brunel property is 156,000, and then the North Common. Um, is 159,000. That would take all the money. It doesn't do anything for the smaller projects, which are equally <coughs> important. Um, several from the Historical um, Commission and the Historical Society, such as washing Emily's dress and preserving historical artifacts and the Tiffany window. And so it's a very, very difficult year for the Community Preservation Act Committee. Well, thank you very much. So if anybody wants to donate. <laughs> yeah. Questions or comments from Ms. Stein? All right, uh, uh, Ms. Burr. I was just going to say, and of course, I know you were also thinking there were housing projects that are also in the pipeline, right. one of which, for example, we applied for basically half the money from the block grant, and then the other half was right. CPA, in right. theory. And like you say, just one category alone could easily sure use enough. all the CPA money, all worthy right. projects. So right. very and, frustrating. And of course, um, CPA um, funds have to be divided. They can't all go to just one aspect. There's um, uh, open space and recreation, there's housing, there's his historical projects and so on. So it, it's a very hard year. Thank you. All right, other liaison reports. Ms. Brewer. Oh, well, of course, yes. Thank you very much for mentioning the Regional School District Planning Committee and the Regional School District Planning Board that is meeting on the 9th, Saturday, upcoming at 9 a.m. in the high school library to talk about whether or not we should walk away from the process or we should consider a region or pre-K to six, or a region that is pre-K to 12, with the understanding that even if you say it's only pre-K to six, that still changes the way your school committee works at the seven to 12 level. So we've got four different towns having lots of different experiences at their individual forums. Um, John mentioned that uh, the Amherst Forum was rather modestly attended, which is perhaps not at all surprising given the circumstances, it's the little individual towns who are more concerned because they're part of Union 28 now instead of part of Union 26, for example, like Pelham, although Pelham also had a good turnout, and what their various situations would look like. It's been very interesting having attended Shootsbury's meeting as well as our own, that at this point, as I hope you've all seen, that we've been very careful as a board and as a committee not to advocate for one thing or another, but simply be in the listening and gathering information phase, trying to answer lots of questions, for those of you who aren't aware of it, regionalschoolplanning.com has a frequently asked questions document on it, et cetera. Um, there's also, we taped the meeting on Saturday, so that's available on Amherst Media, just as the meeting from February 2nd was. So if you're at all curious, lots of information out there viewing public. Um, but it, anyway, people are getting a lot of different messages, people have a lot of different concerns, and it's been difficult to be in the listening phase when there are people who are advocating for a particular course of action and we aren't at that stage yet. So um, we shall see what happens after Saturday. And were we to, cons to continue to move forward, we could obviously change what we chose on Saturday if that later seemed like a good idea. But the point being that if we chose to move forward that we would bring something to the voters in all four mm -hmm. towns in November and we would all four towns want to feel confident that it was going to pass with the flying colors. Not that it was going to pass by five votes, but, but that it was going to be highly acceptable to everyone because it's a yes, no vote. It's, there's no pyramid, there's no other, what if this doesn't pass, we do the other thing. Um, if by some quirk, we would all four take it to our various towns and it would 
not pass in one or more of the towns, then the remaining towns could get together, decide to rewrite the information they basically already had, but then rewrite it to reflect what actual towns would be in it. But it would basically put the process back by a year based on the way the MG, the Mass General Law is written. If on Saturday any of the towns pull out, that's another possibility, and we could continue moving forward with two, three, or four towns. So lots of people, lots of things to think about. There is an email um, to send directly to the Regional School District Planning Board, also on the regionalschoolplanning.com website, and um, hopefully we'll get a lot more feedback, and then Saturday... I'll let y'all know what happens after Saturday because I don't expect you to go to that Saturday meeting as well. <coughs> so you noted um, that feedback is still welcome yep. at, that, via email because right. um, you, I think it was mentioned on Saturday yes, there won't be you. public comment. There will not be public comment on the 9th because not only do we have to make this decision, we're trying to do this in two hours. We have to make the decision, which every town is having to really think about where they're at with everything, but we also have to talk about where we are financially because although it was very wonderful that Amherst got CIC grants in a couple of areas, we didn't get this one. And so there was a grant mentioned on Saturday that was a DESE grant, which we haven't spent yet, but that was only $66,000. We applied for a quarter million through the CIC grant. We aren't getting it. Obviously, that's going to change the face of our process a little bit, but we still have to do all the things. So for example, we're looking at timing. What's it going to look like if we have to hire the attorney to write the entire regional agreement and completely finish it by the June 30th, which is when you have to have the DESE grants spend it by? So it's just you know another little thing we have to work around, but that's something we'll have to talk about on Saturday as well, is how do we deal with those various eventualities and how might it change our timeline and how can we still stay on track given that already you know it's the kind of community where summers can be awkward to get things done during. So. Okay, thank you. So thank uh, you. anyone who still wants to give comment should go to regionalschoolplanning.com and uh, make that group aware. Thank you. Okay, other liaison reports? Very quickly, housing production plan is going to be presented tomorrow night during the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Forum. So if you, you know, toss a coin to decide which one to go to, I have yet a third event I'm going to, but um, housing production plan is going to be presented uh, in the apartments tomorrow night. It's, of course, on the town website, and I believe the document's on the website, too, although I didn't double-check them over here. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is I'm going to ask that an email thread that started today get put in our packet for next time about the various local historic districts because to show where we are with things because town you know we had the study committee for the Dickinson district then it went through town meeting then we appointed the, the actual commission for the Dickinson local historic district we also said here in this body that we would start a study committee for North Amherst various other timeline issues came out and people are questioning so I okay. just want to get that We'll do the next time. Public. Anything else? No. Other folks liaison reports? I think we've talked all we need to talk about safe and healthy neighborhoods. Uh, and so I don't have any reports. I will note that the budget coordinating group meeting that was scheduled for this Thursday morning has been postponed until the 28th of March simply yes. because there's nothing new to talk about. Um, all, folk, all groups were represented at the four <coughs> towns meeting the other day. Um, which is where we learned that folks are good with the regional school assessments from each of the towns. So, um, so everybody's budget has come in uh, under the guidelines. So, uh, and we don't have any new information from the state. So, there's nothing for us to talk about then. Uh, that is all. Open meeting law update. Nothing, Miss Brewer. Right. Right. <laughs> <Good>. Oh, <laughs> actually, yeah. Actually, there is nothing new. I must, the, to, to the best of my knowledge, not that they have an RSS feed to tell me, but yeah, to the best of my knowledge, there's nothing. Good. Okay. Chair's report. I have no chair's report. So the only thing that we have left to do is this parking and street closures. Ms. Stein. I move that the select board approve reservation of 13 metered parking spaces on the north side of Main Street abutting Sweetser Park for the fourth annual walk for aphasia on Saturday, April 20th, 2013 from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Second. Quick comment for the discussion, Ms. Brewer. I just want to ask, and I think you would do this anyway, but if I would like the office to just double check with them on the hours they want this for, because this body is not 
as you know we do this every year for 20 years and I want to make sure they're clear on what days what time they have the park for which is one reservation and what time they have the parking spaces for and do they so that they are completely in understanding and I just want to say that I don't want it to have to come back to the select board and so I just expect that you know the, <laughs> the office will tell them you have it from 7 to 3 and then they say oh no we actually need it starting at 630 the office will say fine <laughs> uh, their email request uh, specifically says 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. for suites or park it doesn't say for the parking spaces so that's we'll why I'm a little check. confused. Okay. So it might be the same, but again, just because, you know, just like they missed their dates this year in terms of the common, I'm just a little worried for them. And we'll just let staff fix it if they need to. Okay. Okay. So, so or, and we'll just amend the motion to say, or as right. needed or something like just that. Just as we would okay. normally do if a weird emergency thing came up. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you. So uh, the other thing I would note about this is this is um, extravaganza day, which is why they don't have which the Which is common. why they don't have the um, So uh, I'm not sure if they're aware of that, Just, but if we're going to be communicating with them again, um, they might have a lot of difficulty with their folks parking. That's quite a busy downtown day, so, so they know what they're up against. Okay, further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Next. I move that the select board approve reservation of five metered parking spaces on the south side of the Unitarian Church parking lot for Barry Roberts to allow borings to take place on the church property on Friday, March 8th, 2013 from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Second. Further discussion, Mr. Musanti. Just want to note, uh, we did get a call from Mr. Roberts today, subsequent to that oh, to the email, email uh, amending the date to March 8th. That's why okay. it's different. So I'm exactly. a mind reader. I knew you'd notice that. <laughs> and so, and, and if it changes again, go for it. But uh, right. So, or or as needed. Because it's by the weather. Right. You know, right. it's largely right. what they're okay. driven by. So good. So we've amended or as needed. Further discussion. Yep. All in favor, say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Is there anything else anyone needs to talk about before we adjourn this meeting? <laughs> I love the way you say it. Um, just to talk. Note, <laughs> yes, <laughs> to talk about. So this body does not meet again then for two weeks. That is March 18th yes. in this room. Millions of meetings. Because of empty bowls next empty week. Empty bowls. Everybody should be going to empty Toronto bowls next week. Empty bowls event. Okay. So otherwise, Mr. I move Hayden. to adjourn. And without objection, this meeting adjourns at 9:31. Thank you very much.